All right. So uh, the plan for the session is we have taken um, 30 questions to discuss the current events in economics. Uh, but I'm sure that all of you guys know that it is not possible to discuss the entire economics current affairs for the year 2022-23 in um, you know, within these 30 questions. It's not possible to have just a single session to cover this as well. So if your expectation is that you have not studied current affairs throughout the year and this session is going to help you get the current affairs that you require for the exam, unfortunately, that is not uh, going to happen. So there are some uh, key analysis with respect to current events, which is not ready information that is available. So I have taken about uh, 15 odd questions, which are like that. So the current affairs, which are not something that you will directly see in the news, but we have to interpret out of various information that is there. So a lot of times the question that comes is, where do we get the data from? So database questions is what is going to be the focus of what we have. Plus there are a couple of, uh, or a few concepts, not a couple of, a few concepts which, we, which I have taken up, which there is some relevance to current events. So concepts related to that uh, are included, plus some other often repeated area or something that, uh, to my understanding, it is something that uh, is has been prominent in the news. Also, sometimes which is confusing in nature. Two similar kind of things which creates confusion. So the re, the uh, you know, mechanism that I adopted is most of you guys have my contact information, uh, the Telegram ID that is there, or my email ID. So if you have been a student of mine, you have that with you. So you guys text me saying uh, I don't understand the difference between this particular term and this particular term. So uh, based on various questions that have come up. So I have done an analysis of what is uh, a little hard to differentiate between. And if there is some relevance of that sort, that is also a logic which I have used. Right. So this is a series of uh, sessions that we have had. You already we are done with a few subjects, uh, but you would have already noticed that no two subjects are actually done in a similar way. It is, uh, it, it is very individually designed according to the subject and the faculty uh, who's taking the particular subject so that is how this session is also going to be it is going to be um a very very specific area that uh, or a set of specific areas that i have picked up okay uh so we have as i told you 30 questions so each question i'll display it on the screen then i'll give you a timeline of about uh 45 seconds okay um, I want you to give me an answer. You can just send the answer to the host panelist, whatever it is. I'll be able to take a look at the answer as well simultaneously as and when you send. And then we'll discuss uh, what is the answer, what is the explanation, what is any associated logic that is concerned with it. In addition to that, if you happen to have any doubt with respect to a particular concept, if it is directly related, you can ask me there. I will give you an answer to that as well. With respect to explaining the concept itself, I can do that. Um, if it is something completely unrelated to this, I can take it up at the end of the session. So after we finish 30 questions, maybe we'll dedicate the last 15 minutes or so to answering uh, areas that I have not taken up, especially concepts, more than current affairs concepts. Okay. Uh, if there's anything. So this is the plan that I have. Uh, shall we start with the first question? I'm just checking if uh, you're able to answer me. The question and answering is working properly. So just to know that, shall we start? So that is the question that I'm starting with. Okay, so yes, 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 yes. Okay. Good. Getting answers properly, which is perfect. Okay. All right, so we'll start with the first question then. There's a timer which will run on the top. Okay, so first question. You can see a timer running on the top. Once it runs out, it'll stop. You have to send me the answer A, B, C, D. Choose the right one. Send it across to me. Okay. So, sorry. I didn't realize that we ran out of time. Happens. It takes a little bit of time for me to get used to this uh, as well. All right. So, I have a series of answers. Uh, so, I have people who have answered A. I have people who have answered B. I have people who have answered C. I have pe people who have answered D. If I were to just glance through and look at what is the most common answer, the most common answer seems to be A. Okay. So this is a question which you can very generically answer. Okay. Um, at least one of the statements. So I'm going into the explanation part now. 
So look at the statement. Uh, the tertiary, which of the following statements uh, about the trends in sectoral classification of the Indian economy is or are correct? So trend is what the question is about. It's not one year's current affairs, but it's current affairs of the over the last decade because the question itself is over the last decade. Okay. So look at the first statement there. The tertiary sector has been contributing around half of India's GVA consistently over the last decade. If you have been in my class, towards the end of the first chapter, we do an analysis of uh, the sectoral classification of the economy. How much does primary sector contribute? How much does secondary and how much does tertiary contribute? So this is a question with respect to the generic trend. Okay. And we have seen in class that roughly 50 percentage of India's GDP or GVA is contributed by the service sector. Um, so the remaining uh, 50 percentage is distributed between your uh, primary sector. In fact, 55 percentage is roughly is what we say with respect to the service sector. The remaining 45 is distributed between your uh, secondary sector, which contributes about 25 and the primary sector, which contributes about 20 roughly is what we say. But the question is this, is that data applicable across the last 10 years and they are not very specific in the first statement and they are not saying that the tertiary sector has been contributing more than half or anything around half so 49 percentage is also around half 47 percentage is also around half 55 percentage is also around half so 45 to 55 is a range that is acceptable for the definition of around half okay so that is the first statement okay the second statement is this is the tricky statement Primary sector is the only sector which has recorded consistent positive growth rate of GVA over the last decade, which means that every single year over the last 10 years, the rate of growth should have been greater, greater than zero in the sense the rate of growth should have been positive. And this becomes tricky. See, in under other circumstances, it would not be tricky. But with a year of COVID in between, where the Indian economy itself went into negative, there was a recession, there was a contraction of GDP, there was a negative GDP growth rate. How realistic is it to imagine that primary sector recorded positive growth? Okay. Now, the answer to that, you can also apply a little bit of logic. When there is a lockdown, you can shut down an industry. When there is a lockdown, you can shut down an IT firm, you can shut down all other tertiary sectors. But when there is a lockdown, can you shut down the farm? Can you say that, okay, the farm sector is going to be shut down? Are you going to tell nature that, okay, don't grow because we are shutting down? It's, that's not likely to happen right so one of the bright spots during the covid itself among the various sectors was that primary sector continued to grow well in fact primary sector's contribution which is usually around 17 percentage of the gdp grew to around 20 percentage of the gdp during covid because of a drop in the other sectors okay which means primary continued to do well with respect to uh, the nation's GDP. So the second statement is the dicey statement. The second statement is correct. The first statement is also correct. The answer here is C, both one and two. Now let's look at the data which substantiate this. Okay. So let, yeah. So this is the data which substantiates it. So this is, as you know, I have shown this in class as well. This is the Press Information Bureau where the National Statistics Organization or National Statistics Office, they publish their data. Um, okay, when I say this, I don't think you are able to see the screen that I'm sharing. You're still seeing the, okay, data is not visible, great. So I'll have to, in that case, go to PPT, I think. Uh, yeah, so now I think it should be visible. Or maybe not. All uh, right, just hold on for a moment. I'll close this. Yeah, I know. I really, so I'll share it now. Okay, now it's visible. So this is the usual document that I share in class with respect to Press Information Bureau, their data on uh, or the MOSP's data on national income accounting. So uh, they have given an introduction. This is quite an elaborate note. This particular note, if possible, I would suggest you to download this and keep it because it's a very unique kind of a document, not like the usual documents that I uh, that we see previously because the information inside it is very, very limited. The second advance estimate that is given, uh, the document published on 28th February 2023, comparatively recent. Okay, So this particular document is quite long and has a lot of information that we require. 
okay but let's focus on the question at hand right now and let's try to answer that first so i'm scrolling down i'm scrolling down all the usual information is done now we go to this data look at the data it starts from 2011 12 and it has data till 2021 22 with has an at the rate because it is a first revised estimate now the question is this just take a look at the data. One is sector wise GV at current prices. Sector wise GV a growth rate is what is given. So, what matters for us is the first, this in percentage. This is what we are going to look at, not the growth rate. Because if you just remember the question that was asked, the question was so the question was um, tertiary sector has been contributing around half of India's GV. So, it's not the rate of growth, it is the contribution of that particular sector which we focused on okay so just going uh we take a look at the data that we have over here uh tertiary sector 2011 so this is the first one okay so 49 percentage 50 percentage 50 uh 0.6 51.8 52.3 52.6 52.5 53.3 54.8 54.4 and 52.5 Okay, so this is the data with respect to tertiary sector, which means that tertiary sector over the last decade has indeed been contributing around half of India's GBA GDP. You can look at it either way. Doesn't make much of a difference. Only the taxation and the subsidies are the difference between them. Still, the data will hold true. Whether it is given as GDP or GBA doesn't matter. Okay, the tertiary sector, which is contributing around 30 percentage, has actually sort of sort of reduced and brought it to around 25 percentage. So roughly 25, 26 percentage every year it has been contributing. Primary has been contributing roughly 20 percentage every year. Okay, so this is the data based on which we are going. This is the trend that we need to observe. This is the trend based questions, not just one year, but across the years. Okay, so this is the source of the data. Once again, uh, let me see if I'll probably share the screen itself so that. Let's see if this works. All right. It becomes easy for me to shuttle. So that is the uh, answer to the first question. Do you guys have any queries with respect to this? Okay, uh, yeah, there is a second question that comes, second part that comes in which I didn't address. I'm sorry about that. Primary sector is the only sector which has recorded consistent positive growth rate of GVA. Okay, so that is something that needs addressing as well. So uh, the data necessary for that is over here. Again, the, the second uh, uh, set of columns that we have over here. The first one is the sector wise share in GVA. Is the sector wise share in GVA. But the second statement is with respect to growth in GVA. Okay, growth in GVA. Now, when it comes to growth in GVA, take a look at it. Primary, secondary, tertiary, all of them are in positive. 2019, we had a recession or we had a sort of a slowdown in growth or a reduction in growth in secondary. Um, in 2020-21, we had a reduction in, in growth in both secondary as well as tertiary due to COVID. But if you look at the primary sector throughout from 2012-13, say 12, 13, to 2021 22 every year you will find a positive sign whether it is 1.2 percentage growth or whether it is 4.8 percentage growth or whatever is the rate of growth it has been a positive rate of growth that we have had for the last decade so this is again the interpretation from the data just so that there is or just because there is a minus sign over here it is something that should, you should be observing whenever you find something unique in a list, list of data everything is positive just one or two are negative Everything is moving up. Something alone is falling down, as you will see subsequently with respect to graphs. Those are worth noting. Service sector, throughout it has been positive, but just one year alone, it is showing a negative. And that too, it has been very high positive. So 6, 7, 8 percentage is what is growing by, and there is a drop to minus 4.2 percentage. So this is of significance then. All right. So that is the second part of the statement. Um, all right, great. So please show the document name again. So what I would suggest is I would just um, suggest you to type uh, okay, press information bureau. So what I did is I'll just show you the uh, way I searched itself. Just search for GDP PIB. I have typed and the second advance estimates in the PIB website. Just click on that. 
you will get to this particular uh, area. So this has all the information with respect to uh, the data. You can find it in the MOSP website itself, but this is the easier way to access this data. Okay. All right. Uh, so there is a request that I should be sharing the PPT with respect to this. PPT is just the questions. None of this is PPT. Uh, I am just sharing the screen from my laptop. Uh, my, if you look at it, it's a browser that I'm sharing. Okay. Let's see, I'll, I'll try to share a P, uh, PDF. I'll tag it somewhere and try to share it with you guys. PDF of the PPT that we have, but there is nothing in the PPT as such. I don't, see, don't assume that these are questions that are going to be asked as it is in the UPC exam. The questions are not the focus here. The information that we take out of is it is what is the focus over here. So don't uh, no, uh, get to attach these questions and think that this is going to appear as it is. I don't have that level of you know, knowledge to predict what is the UPC question going to be. You're nowhere close to being uh, close to making such cases. Anyway, moving to the second question, which is again a continuation, Indian economy trends. So we are starting the timer now. Okay, so again, sorry, time ran out. I didn't realize. Um, anyway, so the overwhelming answer, I was looking at the answer. That's why I, I was not able to, I, I have the answer on the side in a different device. I'm looking at the chat box over there. So that's the reason why I uh, keep losing track of uh, the fact that time has run out. Anyway, so the overwhelming answer seems to be D, 1 and uh, 2. Uh, there's one statement which you can reasonably uh, eliminate. The third statement, which says, for the first time in a decade, the exports outperformed imports, which means exports is greater than imports. If that does happen, just know that it will be all over the news. There is no way that you will miss such a news. Have you seen a news like that? That exports have outperformed imports. Don't have to. You don't even have to think, have I seen it in some remote corner? No. It will definitely be there as a big thing in the news if it happens. It hasn't happened. So you would not have seen it in the news. So third is wrong. Okay. The moment three is wrong, you eliminate C. Now the question is, is it A? Is it B? Is it D? Which is why most people went for D. Seems like correct. The answer is actually A. Uh, the first statement, quite a few people have answered the correct one as well, have given me the correct answer as well. So once again, we go to the same document for the data that we require. So the data is in a different part of this document. Okay. So this is one year. It is not over a decade or anything. It is just one year's data. We will take a look at the current price date. Okay. Okay. So what is the question about? Now, if you know the aggregate demand formula, so I am not able to zoom it any further for some reason. So I'm able to zoom out really, really small, but it is not zooming in, sadly. Okay. So again, the same data, if you want, you can uh, access it in your device, but I can point it out to you. Uh, let me just see if there is an option for me to zoom it from here yeah so it's not very frequently that my technical skills work uh, accidentally it happened to work now so good good for me so uh, the question once again let's go back to the question the question states um, household consumption expenditure contributes more than half of India's GDP. So the moment you see the word expenditure and in the context of GDP, you have to think in your mind the expenditure method of calculating GDP, C plus I plus G plus X minus M. C is the household consumption expenditure, I is the investment expenditure and X minus M is what is the third statement about it. G is the only thing which we have not asked over here. Okay, so C plus I plus G plus X minus M. Look at the examples that we have used in class. The examples that we have used in class says in the in the example uh, on the circular flow of income that we discussed in class, the first thing that I use is 60 percentage is uh, household consumption expenditure. 30 percentage is investment expenditure. Then the remaining uh, is 10 percentage goes towards government. And then we have exports and imports that come in. And Maybe I have mentioned, maybe I have not mentioned, but that is representative of what is the reality in the economy as well. Take a look at this data. Uh, this is the share in GDP, private final consumption expenditure, as we see over here. Okay, I'm not able to choose parts of it, uh, but 
share in GDP, the column that is highlighted here, you will find a number 57.2, 58.3, 58.5. That is what is C. The one next to it, government final consumption expenditure, roughly 10. That is G, C plus G. Then the gross fixed capital formation plus change in stock plus valuables, which technically is referred to as gross capital formation or more commonly referred to as uh, investment. It contributes roughly around 30, 35 percentage, roughly, because there is exports and imports also, or 30 percentage is something that you can uh, assume it as. Okay, You can't expect a perfect 100 as such. It will eventually appear, but there are discrepancies as well. And exports, you will notice that exports are lesser, imports are greater. It has been the case as a percentage of GDP, or in absolute terms also, you can take a look at the previous one the table that is given above but the question is with respect to percentages so this is the source of the information based on which the question is set okay going back to the question household consumption expenditure contributes more than half of india's gdp it contributes roughly around 60 percentage of india's gdp and you don't need to know all of this you can simply go by the common statements that here you hear india is a consumption oriented economy you go back to the previous question you hear india is a uh, service sector oriented economy, tertiary sector contributes around half of India's GDP. Consistently over the decade or not is a different thing. That's a general statement that we know. This is also a general statement that we know. Okay, what is the general statement that we know? India is a consumption oriented economy. So more than half of India's GDP is contributed by household consumption. Correct. Investment expenditure contributes less than a quarter. Less than a quarter means less than 25 percentage. That is not true. It contributes more than 30 percentage of India's GDP. Okay. So always try to remember data in round numbers, 50 percentage greater or lesser, 25 percentage greater than greater or lesser, one third, one fourth. Try to remember the data with respect to some, you hear, you some come across a data of 28 percentage somewhere. Very hard to remember the 28 percentage. Just remember it as one fourth, greater than one fourth, around one fourth, some way to remember it. Okay. So that is what you should be looking at doing. So the answer here is A, one only. Uh, any queries? Okay, we have run out of time for a change. I noticed it. Okay, so um, I think more, a lot of people have given me the correct answer. The correct answer here is A, one and two only. Uh, so it's good. It's You are familiar with this particular index. The reason why I think this particular index is, it's an index uh, which um extends from the first chapter about production whether production is likely to happen or not so it is a growth oriented indicator or index that is there not something that we discuss in class so i thought we'd pick it up so that we can get familiar we can familiarize ourselves with it first question who publishes it uh there is not a standard one globally there are this is a global index but uh calculated regionally in every country there are multiple organizations which are involved in it. There is an organization called as INS Market Tool. There is SNP Global. There are such different organizations. So in India's case, if I'm not wrong, it is uh, INS Market Tool. Um, so that is the organization that is involved. You also find SNP Global that is mentioned over there. Uh, so the first uh, uh, statement, let's take a look at it one by one. It is an indicator of business activity, both in the manufacturing and service sectors. So there are three types of purchasing managers index which are actually published. There is a separate purchasing managers index published for the manufacturing sector, manufacturing PMI. There is a separate manufacturing purchasing managers index published for the service sector, services PMI. And then through a mathematical uh, combination, these two are brought together and a composite purchasing managers index for the entire production is also published, which means it is an indicator of business activity for both manufacturing as well as service sector. The question doesn't specifically say manufacturing PMI. It just generally says PMI. So the first statement is correct. The second statement, PMI is calculated based on sub-indices such as new orders, output, employment, suppliers, delivery time, stocks of items purchased. These are some of the indices that are there because with, we, we have separate purchasing managers index for manufacturing and services and a composite one. We cannot say specifically these are the exact sub-indices that are there. These are some of the sub-indices which are used. It is correct. It is a very generic kind of a statement. There is nothing obviously wrong about it. So you will have to naturally assume it to be right. Okay. I'm just giving you a logic there. So how exactly is this, does this calculation work? 
look at the name of the index it says purchasing managers index which means when the survey is conducted they go to the purchasing managers in these organizations in various manufacturing and service sectors and they go and ask specific question as to how much of new orders are they placing in the upcoming period it's a monthly index it's published every month so in the upcoming month how many new orders are you placing okay how what is the uh, in target output that you have how many people are you employing in the upcoming period so all these are the information that is quantitatively gathered from the purchasing managers and they are also asked for their subjective opinion as to what they believe is going to be the situation in the next one month in their industry not in the global economy as such in their industry so their opinion is also something that they provide so all of this is brought together so weightages are provided for it and finally an index is released where if you get a score of 50 one month it's 50 next month it is 50 it means that there is no growth or there is no contraction that is going to happen if the number is greater than 50 it indicates an expansion in the business activity if the number falls below 50 it is an indication of contraction that is what is the error in the third statement a figure of above 50 denotes a contraction in business activity that's wrong. A few a figure above 50 in denotes a, an expansion in the business activity. One below 50 indicates a contraction. 50 exactly as it is means that there is no uh, expectation of change that is going to happen. So the answer is A, 1 and 2. 1 and 2 only. So let's take a look at the next question. If you do have any questions, immediately send it across. So I will take a look at it and address. Okay, great. Moving on. Okay, time ran out. Sorry. Again, lost it. Uh, all right. Skipped. <laughs> One person who is it skipped. Okay, fair enough. At least you are honest with it. Uh, nothing to lose, but still no random guesses. That's good preparation for you, PSC. Anyway, so... um. The next five questions, including this one, this one and the next four questions are going to be an analysis of the budget. Okay. So, um, what are the trends that are observed in the budget? Um, decadal probably. Uh, decadal is there plus yearly is also there. So, this was in the news a lot. Last year also it was in the news. This year also it is in the news because the government has been proclaiming or not, not just proclaiming, they have been, they have uh, made it very obvious that capital expenditure has been significantly increased in the budget overall budget uh, estimates that are provided there is a significant increase in capital expenditure compared to previous periods there is no doubt about it but the question is only about what is the extent of the increase now i personally don't expect a question or a statement like the first one where it says 37 percentage and all those things that is not the upsc style of questioning so they might replace it with say uh, roughly one third or whatever is the number that they, the, whatever is the way that they want to represent the data or they may not go for data itself but this is something that you should be knowing because because look at this is the budget document all i have done is there is a document called as budget at a glance you are all familiar with the um, uh, budget the government's budget website indian budget just type indian budget you will go to this website you can download this document called as budget at a glance Look for the full document. There is a document called as budget, budget at a glance, full, complete document. It's about 26 pages. Just take a look at that. In the first page of the document itself, they have highlighted, or the second page, they have highlighted these particular info, this particular information. Okay. So, what is the information that they are trying to convey? The total expenditure in the budget estimate for the upcoming year is estimated at 45 lakh crore. Uh, of which total capital expenditure is 10 lakh crore. You have already got the answer to the second statement in this. Total expenditure is 45 lakh crore. Capital expenditure is 10 lakh crore. What is going to be the remaining 35 lakh crore? The remaining 35 lakh crore is going to be revenue expenditure because total expenditure is equal to capital plus revenue plus capital. Capital is only going to be 10, which means the remaining 35 is revenue. The second statement is capital has out or capital expenditure is greater than revenue expenditure. Clearly not true. Now let's look at the following one. Budget of the upcoming year reflects or 
in our case the present year reflects continuing strong commitment of the union government to boost economic growth by investing in infrastructure development leading to an increase in capital expenditure of by 37.4 percentage over the revenue or sorry revised estimates of 2020 to 23 Okay. Then they have mentioned something called as effective capital expenditure. I'll explain what is effective capital expenditure expenditure to you. But this particular paragraph itself conveys to us what is the attempt at uh, conveying the information that is to be conveyed over here. I will run through the budget document entirely after the five questions are over because if I scroll down, I have a feeling that maybe I'll give you the answer to one upcoming question, uh, one or two upcoming questions that are there. So I'm refraining from doing that. We'll take it question by question. so this is the data based on which this particular question is uh, given uh, what is the difference between budget estimate and revised estimate i will uh, give you an answer to that uh, as well okay just give me one moment i i will let's get back to the question and then we'll uh, take it up okay so the statement here is capital expenditure and budget estimate uh, 2023 24 is roughly 37 point 37% more than revised estimate that's correct capex in budget for the first time is greater than revenue expenditure nowhere close okay so uh, 43 lakh crore of its 10 lakh crore or 45 lakh crore of its 10 lakh crore there is capital the remaining 35 is still revenue revenue still is a huge 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 component of the overall expenditures so uh, second statement is wrong the first statement is correct okay again when you have statements like for the first time it is greater it should have been there prominently in the news if you have read the days news on the days after the uh, publication of the budget or the announcement of presentation of the budget you should have come across it if you have actively read the news okay so the answer here is a one only okay moving on to the next question the fourth question all right so time has run out i am still getting varied kind of answers there are two trickeries in this uh, two things to observe for in this first thing to observe is arrange the above in the order of increasing value of deficits which means the first deficit should be the least deficit the last deficit should be the highest deficit you can apply simple logic to eliminate a couple of options what is the simple logic of all deficits fiscal deficit is going to be the highest deficit without a doubt fiscal deficit means total money which the government will have to borrow that is how much is the how much is the total shortfall for the government that is the maximum deficit why do i say so because that is the deficit for the entire budget itself when it comes to revenue deficit that is budget only for sorry deficit only for one part of the budget which logically has to be lesser than fiscal deficit okay if you look at the formula for primary deficit itself it says fiscal deficit minus interest payments which means this primary deficit is going to be definitely lesser than fiscal deficit and effective revenue deficit is equal to revenue deficit minus uh, grants for creation of capital assets which means effective revenue deficit has to be lesser than revenue deficit if this is the case then fiscal deficit is going to be the highest value which means in our options that should be the last one if that is the last one option a is ruled out option d is ruled out so two options are ruled out right away okay so these are certain logics that you have to know so if you are going to choose between b and c then then you don't have to worry about revenue deficit because in both b and c 3 1 3 1 that is the last two which means the highest is fiscal deficit the second highest is revenue deficit okay now the question is is revenue is uh, primary deficit in second place uh, or or is primary deficit is the least deficit or is effective revenue deficit the least deficit this is the only question that needs to be answered this is not easy this is not easy at all only if you know you will be able to answer why do i say so because of a data that i am going to show right now to you okay i am looking for this particular uh, graph okay so what does this graph say this graph says the darker line which is on top that is a fiscal deficit clearly fiscal deficit is greater logically it has to be greater fiscal deficit is a percentage of gdp fiscal deficit in absolute terms it won't matter it will still be the same because everything is a percentage of gdp which means that in absolute terms also the pattern will hold true okay followed by it comes revenue deficit in the reverse order is what i'm saying 
if you notice carefully till 2021-22 effective revenue deficit was in in that reverse order in third place which means the second highest deficit and primary deficit was the least deficit sorry second lowest deficit was effective revenue deficit and primary deficit was the least deficit that uh, our budget had that was there as per the budget but you will notice that from 2021-22 there has been a change in trend and the green line has come down the whatever is the other color that is there that line has actually gone up which means that effective revenue deficit since 2021-22 is the least deficit that is there okay the ideal value of effective revenue deficit is actually zero because look at the formula Effective revenue deficit is equal to revenue deficit minus grants used for asset creation. Ideal situation, the entire revenue deficit should be used for asset creation, Gra should be in the form of grants used for asset creation, which means if we have a revenue deficit, the entire money is used indirectly but productively. Okay, it becomes an effective capital expenditure. Okay, now. In that case, it is a good trend to notice that effective revenue deficit is going down because effective revenue deficit should ideally be zero. When it comes to primary deficit, primary deficit is equal to fiscal deficit minus interest payments, which means if primary deficit is equal to zero, it is a bad situation to be in because when will it be zero? When the fiscal deficit and interest payments are equal, which means every single money that is borrowed is being used for paying interest itself which means primary deficit being zero is a bad situation to be in. Okay, So in a way you can say in terms of arranging it in terms of logic, this is a better scenario that we are in. It's, a, it's an observation of something which can be interpreted as positive. You can't say you can't make such judgments just because there is a change in positioning, but I'm trying to explain the logic that is associated. Okay, so this is what you take away if you see a graph like this. Now, what is observable here? If let's say all the graphs throughout the journey has been in the way where fiscal is highest, revenue is next, effective revenue is next, primary is next, there is nothing to observe. But in 2021 22, there has been a change in trend. It is worth observing, it is worth making a note. Okay, so this is the uh, concept that is there. Now comes another part which I told you I, earlier, I told you I'll answer it. Uh, what is meant by effective capital expenditure? So there is this component called as, which based on which your effective revenue deficit concept itself works. Effective revenue deficit is what? Revenue deficit minus grants used for asset creation. Similarly, effective capital expenditure is equal to capital expenditure plus grants used for asset creation because effectively those grants are being used as capital expenditure, though not by the union government, the union government is ensuring that that fund is used for capital expenditure purposes. So that is what is called as effective capital expenditure. We came across that earlier in the introduction when which I showed you in this paragraph. Towards the end, you will notice that this part, effective capital expenditure at 13,70,949 shows an increase of 30.1 percentage over the revenue expenditure. Okay. So that 30 point, more than the 30.1, the cons, the point is the government is trying to convey a concept called as effective capital expenditure. You may come across that concept as well, effective capital expenditure. Okay. All right. Moving on then. I still haven't answered one of the questions which, are, which was asked earlier about what is the difference between RE and BE. I will take it up after the series of questions on uh, the budget is over, okay? Because I don't want to show uh, any question without intention. Um, yeah, so I, I noticed that. I noticed your question earlier itself. Okay, so once more about capital effective capital expenditure. Yes, uh, effective capital expenditure is nothing but capital expenditure plus... Um, grants for asset creation. If you remember the formula for effective revenue deficit, rev effective revenue deficit is equal to revenue deficit minus grants for asset creation, right? That same terminology, because you are subtracting it from revenue expenditure, you need to add it somewhere, right? So you're adding it as part of capital expenditure in, and the government is claiming it to be effective capital expenditure because that grant is used, in asset, used for asset creation. So effective capital expenditure is that. Effective revenue deficit, effective capital expenditure. Okay. 
this year all deficits are showing gra grants used for state assets um mithilesh it is not explicitly said that it is for state asset creation but it is simply said grants used for asset creation the government classifies it that way effective capital i'll repeat effective capital expenditure is equal to capital expenditure plus grants used for asset creation grants are usually part of revenue or grants are always part of revenue expenditure there is no doubt about it but there is a component of revenue expenditure which is indirectly resulting in asset creation and the central government is ensuring that asset is getting created as a result of those grants because it is a conditional expenditure the central government gives it to the states and says you must use it for creating assets otherwise we will take the money back from you which means central government is ensuring that assets are getting created for the money that is being provided all right so that is why it is called as effective capital expenditure i repeat effective capital expenditure is equal to capital expenditure the usual capital expenditure plus grants provided for creating assets grants for asset creation okay great moving on to the next question time starts We are out of time. Let's take a look at the answers. Okay. Okay, the previous one, I think I didn't give the answer. The previous one, the answer was B4231. Okay, 4231. Now coming to this one. Okay, so uh, market borrowings contribute the most towards total borrowings. So what are market borrowings? Borrowings of the government in the form of GSEC, in the form of T-bills, in the form of all everything else that conventionally that they borrow within India. So that is market borrowing. Okay, so what else is there other than market borrowing? The government borrows from RB in the form of ways and means advances. The government borrows from um, your state governments in the form of treasury bills. Um, then the government borrows from... Uh, say your small savings fund and all those things those are outside of market borrowings okay market borrowings contribute the most towards total borrowing without a doubt you should be uh, knowing that this is to be uh, knowing this to be true so that is correct then external borrowing contribute more than one fourth of the total borrowings we have discussed this in class that external borrowing is not a major uh, contributor to india's borrowing india's you no know, advantage you could say with respect to borrowings is that uh, most of our liabilities are internal in nature. So the second statement is wrong. The first statement, one only, is correct. So let's take a look at the data to substantiate this. So this is the data. Okay. Sources of financing fiscal deficit. So what is meant by market borrowing? Market borrowing refers to, look at the number two over here, market borrowing, Vijayashree, you can take a look at it now. This is what I'm explaining the first point. Market borrowings is GSEC plus tables. GSEC plus tables. Okay. So this is market borrowing. The total debt receipts in the budget estimates is this much. So roughly 18 lakh crore. Roughly 18 lakh crore. Of 18 lakh crore, 12 crore or 12.3 lakh crore is in the form of market borrowings, which is close to 70 percentage, close to, because assume it to be 18 lakh and 12 lakh, 12 lakh out of 18 lakh is uh, two third, right? So two third is 66, 66 and a half percentage. So roughly 70 percentage of the total borrowing that the government does is in the form of market borrowings. Okay. In terms of borrowing, that is a major source. Look at external debt. It is not even in lakhs. It is 22,000 crore, which is actually roughly only 1 percentage, 1.2 percentage or something like that. 
So that is all that the government is borrowing from external sources. What did the question say? The question said uh, one fourth. What did the question say? The question said external borrowings contribute more than one fourth. More than one fourth means 25 percentage. This is nowhere close to 24 percentage. It's only around one percentage that is the borrowing from external sources. So this is the data to be observed. What else are the other sources? Uh, securities against small savings. So there is a lot of small savings that people deposit in post office funds and all those things, right? So those are what are called as small savings. So how does the government, how, do, how is interest provided on that? The government, so people put it in the small savings account. The government issues securities to them, uh, to those organizations like post office and all those things. And the government borrows money from there, not directly from the public, not from the market, but from the small savings organizations, post office deposits and all those things. That is the uh, second biggest source of borrowing. Then you have other uh, receipts, which is internal debt uh, pub, uh, your, uh, from other organizations, government-owned organizations itself, any internal borrowing that comes in or borrowing from the public account of India, all of that contributes around 5,42,000. State provident fund money is a very, very, uh, comparatively, again, a very small percentage, less than uh, the external debt. Okay. All right. So it's a very interesting question. When did my math skills improve? Uh, what can I say? A little bit of preparation probably helped. I'm still not sure my math skills have improved. So you don't know how much of calculation goes on in my mind before I actually utter something. Thank you for that. Anyway, I think I'll have a sleepless night tonight because someone appreciated my math skills. Anyway, moving on. So that is the source of this particular uh, question, that is the area from which we asked the uh, question. So one only is the correct answer. The second one is wrong. Okay. Moving on to the next question. I think two more questions from budget. We start, time starts. All right, so we ran out of time. Uh, okay, so what is the answer here? Net tax revenue accounts for less than half of the total receipts. Debt receipts account for around 40% of the total receipts. Which of the statements are correct? Let's take a look at the data. Okay, so there are some round, round things that you will see. This is rupee goes to, this is expenditure. This is the uh, receipt part. So rupee comes from, which means where is the money coming from? They have given a compilation over here. Data is not uh, exactly the precise one that we want, but um, take a look at it. Corporation tax contributes 15 percentage of the overall receipts of the government, including capital and revenue, both of them, because you will find borrowings also as a part of the same thing. Rupee comes from overall in the budget. So this is revenue receipt plus capital receipt. Okay. So corporation tax, 15 percentage, income tax, 15 percentage, roughly is what they are saying. Okay. Customs duty, 4 percentage, union excess duty, 7 percentage, goods and services tax, 17 percentage. Take a look at, add all of them up, 30, 34, plus 7, okay, I think, uh, yeah, 41, thank you, uh, 41, uh, 48, 58, so roughly 60 percentage, thank you, Rajasri Mohan, I was looking for someone to help me out with respect to the addition, uh, but yeah, 58 percentage is contributed by purely tax receipts. 
But please note, this is gross tax receipts, not the net tax receipts. The question is about net tax receipts. But even if it comes to net tax receipts, what is the difference between gross and net tax receipts? Out of the gross, some amount of money, although the center collects it, it has to give it to the state. It collects it on behalf of the state. I'm not talking about the devolution of funds. Certain taxes like IGST, half of IGST belongs to the states, right? So that part uh, has to go towards the states. So even when it comes to net tax uh, revenue, it is still more than 50 percentage. That is why the first statement is correct. When that happens, borrowings and liabilities become close to 40 percentage because that is what the statement says, right? It does not. Here it says borrowings and liabilities are 34 percentage. And uh, the statement says roughly account for 40 percentage of the total receipts. So just to take a look at that data, let's go to some um, numbers. OK, yeah. So here it is of the total receipts of 45 lakh crore, which is given over here, 45 lakh crore. OK, so 23 lakh crore is in the form of net tax receipts, which is greater than 50 percentage. OK, 46 lakh, half of it is 23. So 45, more than 23 is there, which means more than half is in the form of tax receipts. Borrowings and other liabilities are roughly 18 um, lakh crore, which is again around that roughly 40 percentage mark. Uh, so that is why the data given there is right. OK, so the reason why this data is important is because look at it, 50 percentage is contributed by tax revenue receipts, 40 percentage is contributed by borrowing, DCR. Look at the components of receipts. There is um, tax revenue receipts, non-tax revenue receipts, non-debt capital receipts and debt capital receipts, where tax revenue receipts and DCR itself contributes 90 percentage of the total receipts of the government, which means your uh, non-tax revenue receipts and non-debt capital receipts are a very negligible part of the overall uh, money that the government receipts, receives. Okay, Cumulatively, it accounts for only 10 percentage. That is an important observation that tax and borrowing contributes 90 percentage of the government's receipts. So that is a very important cumulatively, roughly 90 percentage of the receipts, more than 90 percentage actually. Okay, So the it shows the comparative insignificance of non-tax revenue receipts and uh, non-debt capital receipts. Comparative. I'm not saying it's insignificant, but in the context of the other receipts, it loses its significance. Okay. So that is the basis of the question that we had. The answer here is the first statement is wrong. The second statement is correct. B2 only is the answer. Moving to the next question. Time starts. Almost run out of time. Yeah, so we have run out of time. What's the answer? Let me take a look at the choices that have been given. It's a bit of a tricky question to guess. Okay, so let me see if there's anyone who has given the correct answer, not initially. Okay, so there is Signesh Babu, Rospin Vignesh Babu. One person. What? Only one person has given the correct answer? Okay. Okay, fine. Finally, someone else too. Kirutik. Okay, fine. So the answer here is C. Two and three are the correct statements. Uh, two and three. C is the correct answer. So let's again. So, okay, after I gave answer, I'm getting an answer saying C, which is very interesting. I didn't know you could do that. Okay, anyway, consider the following statements about the trends of tax receipts over the last uh, decade based on the union budget of 2023-24. Last decade based on the latest data. 
tax to gdp ratio has been consistently increasing what is this concept of tax to gdp ratio are you familiar with the concept called as tax buoyancy there is a term called as tax buoyancy which is nothing but increase in the rate uh, in increase in tax revenue percentage increase in tax revenue as a proportion of percentage increase in gdp tax revenue growth rate divided by gdp growth rate okay so that is what is called as tax buoyancy in a in a system where taxation is buoyant buoyant means floating doing well the tax revenue grows by a greater extent than the gdp itself grows so that is tax buoyancy that is what is tax to gdp ratio let's take a look at the data okay let's also take a look at the other two statements net tax receipts have been great net de okay sorry direct tax receipts have been greater than indirect tax receipts during uh, most years it's a very generic statement during most years okay and centers net tax revenue has been consistently increasing so two words to focus in the first statement one or three words to focus in the first statement tax to gdp ratio has been consistently increasing so there are two things that you could be asked in the exam over the last decade tax to gdp ratio has increased if they have simply said tax to gdp ratio has increased over the last decade it means that 10 years ago versus today if today the value is greater than what was 10 years ago then you can say it has increased over the decade but it says consistently increasing which means not only should it be greater now when compared to 10 years ago every intervening year should have had an increasing trend every year first year second year should be greater third year should be greater fourth should be greater tenth year should be greater than ninth year and so on okay so that is consistently increasing in the third statement also you will find consistently increasing so that's a very important information usually in upsc exams when you come across a term consistently increasing the likelihood of such a statement being correct is very very low because something an economic information being consistently high the chances are very low except if you are talking about absolute numbers absolute numbers are likely to increase because take government's borrowing fiscal deficit although as a percentage of gdp it may decrease from one year to another because the gdp is increasing the actual amount borrowed itself is going to increase is most likely going to increase although fiscal deficit as a percentage of gdp may have decreased so if the question is about fiscal deficit as a percentage of gdp or growth rate or something like that the chances of consistent increase are less so the first statement being correct is less likely whereas the third statement is not about growth rate it's not about percentage it's an absolute value centers net tax revenue amount of money has been consistently increasing the chances of such a statement being correct are quite high and the next important word to focus is direct tax receipts have been greater than indirect tax receipts during most years it means every single year over the last decade it doesn't matter what has happened more than 5 years over the decade over the last decade if it's greater than Um, uh, direct tax is greater than indirect tax. That's good enough. Most means majority, more than half. That is all that is uh, necessary. Okay. All right. So um, let's take a look at the data now. All right. So before I answer this, there's a question about uh, I have doubts regarding subject. How can I communicate? I can. I couldn't contact through Telegram. So uh, don't ask me these these sort of questions during the session that is happening. Ask me at the end of it when I ask you is there something else. Make a note of it and ask me later. The reason I say so is because I will miss your chat. I, I even if I've read it, I'll forget it by the time we come back because all the people are answering over here. Hundred answers per question. It means that. your query will get lost so keep this aside and ask me this in the end when i ask you if you have any further questions we'll find a way i don't know what is the solution but we'll find a solution okay so tax to gdp ratio uh let's scroll down i think this is the last question from uh, budget so i can freely show you the entire uh, graph okay this is deficit trends i think it's on no and <laughs> sorry i will take a look at the data ah oh, here it is okay trends in tax receipts okay this is the percentage of gdp this is what is called as tax to gdp ratio because look at what is given over here tax receipts as a percentage of gdp tax to gdp ratio how much is the tax to gdp ratio is given over here roughly around 10 percentage tax to gdp ratio we know that already remember in the government expenditure part you remember Uh, your uh, consumption expenditure is uh, 
consumption expenditure is 60 percentage investment expenditure is 30 percentage 10 percentage is in the form of government expenditure so if the government has to spend they have to get money in the form of taxes right so only through taxes they'll be able to spend so how much should be the tax as a percentage of GDP? Roughly around 10 percentage. That will hold true. But the question is, has it been increasing? Take a look at the red line. Is it a straight upward moving line? No. It is not a straight upward moving line. It is moving in all directions. 10.1, 10, 10.6, 10 11.2, 11.2, 10.9, 9.8, 10.3. It is moving all over the place. As a percentage, the likelihood of a consistent change is very, very low. Okay. So the first statement is negated. First statement is wrong. What was the second statement? The second statement said uh, direct tax receipts have been greater than indirect tax receipts during most years. Now, this data is not about the direct tax receipts itself as a percentage of GDP, but because it's both as a percentage of GDP, we can take a look at this data itself and we can come in. I will show you the other data also. So in, in let's say 2013-14, 5.6, 4.4, direct tax. The yellow one is the direct tax. Direct tax is greater. Next year, 5.2, 4.4, greater. 2015, 5.4, 5.2 greater, but 2016, 5.6, 5.5, which means indirect tax is greater than direct tax. There is one year where indirect tax is greater than direct tax. Then it comes back to normal. See, 2017, 18, 18, 19, 19, 20 is normal. 2021 again, direct tax is 4.8, indirect tax is 5.5 percentage in, in terms of percentage of GDP, which is applicable throughout also. Then once again, normalcy is restored, 2021, 22, 6, 5.4, 5.5, or 6, 5.1, 6, 5.1. But eight out of 10 years, direct tax is greater than indirect tax. The statement says, direct tax receipts have been greater than indirect tax receipts during most years. Statement is correct. Eight out of 10 is most. There is no question about it. Okay. So you can also take a look at absolute numbers here, rupees in lakh crore. Okay, how much is the lakh crore? You will notice that, uh, okay, this is just uh, direct tax. They have not split it as direct and indirect. Okay, total tax. So third statement, center's net tax revenue has been consistently increasing. Look at the blue uh, with every passing year. Is there any year where the blue is lesser than the previous year? No. 8.2 lakh, 9 lakh, 9.4 lakh, 11 lakh, 12.4 lakh, 13.2, 13.6, 14.3, 18.19.20, .20, 23. Every year in absolute terms, it has been increasing. As a percentage of GDP, it would not consistently increase. But the question is not as a percentage of GDP. The question is in absolute terms. Net centers tax revenue has been consistently increasing. Correct. Okay. So that is how. We can look at it. But take a look at the other receipts also. Other than uh, borrowing everything they have given, non-tax revenue, there is no consistent increase. 2, 2.5, 2.7, 1.9, 2.4, 3.3, 2.1, it is varying. Look at non-debt capital receipts, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 1.2, but then 1.1, 0.7, 0 0.6. 0 so it keeps varying. Okay, so there is no consistent trend. But with tax revenue receipts, there is a consistent trend that is there. Again, something to be observed. So when you come across data like this, this is what you need to observe. Patterns, trends are what you have to observe. All right. Okay, so now I will take up any question that you have with respect to budget document because I, I finished all the questions that is there with respect to budget document. So there's a question which Arun is asking. Nowadays, GST revenue have been increasing. How can I infer it, sir? So GST, uh, uh, I mean, with respect to direct tax revenues higher than indirect taxes. Um, yeah, so I don't understand the connection that you're trying to ask, Arun. Uh, can you make some connection and ask me that question? Rephrase that question. Very open-ended what you're saying. What will be the correct statement for the first option? Uh, first option, what will be the correct statement? Uh, tax to GDP ratio has been consistently increasing. You can't say it. So it does not, that is wrong itself. What do you mean? How can we put it into a correct statement? Tax to GDP ratio has been growing inconsistently over the last decade. That's probably correct if you want it to be. Uh, Kirti, that document, I don't need to share. Government shared it with me. The government has shared it with you also. Everyone can access the document. Okay, just go to, okay, I'll show you what I do. So let's take, let's take Pro. Okay. I'll just, uh,
you are able to see what i'm doing right okay so what am i doing i'm simply typing uh okay indian budget indian budget what's the first website that i get indian budget india budget or gov.in open i'm teaching you how to download a document uh, okay budget at a glance you'll notice right in the center budget at a glance budget at a glance full that's it download the document this is the document that we have been referring to okay i hope that helps this is the same place from which you can download the economic survey as well if you want so economic survey you can either go click over this over here there is a field here great or you can just simply type economic survey it will take you to the exact economic survey it will take you to this page where you can download the chapters you can download a list of tables and charts statistical appendix everything that you require you have it over here okay all right uh moving on to the budget document itself i have a few queries i'll answer it one by one um will fill a boil deck come under gst because once it was asked in a test series i don't know i don't know i don't have that information ready with me sorry okay um arun i am just wondering if you have rephrased yes you have rephrased the question i am taking a look at it in that question second option is mentioned about direct tax revenue is higher than indirect tax revenue nowadays gst revenue has been increasing okay so gst revenue has been increasing without doubt that's the case but if you have been noticing the news uh, your income tax revenue has also been increasing corporate tax revenue has also been increasing okay it it has been the case now how do i how do we know that so there is a a table here take i i'm just checking if what i'm showing is visible yes what i'm showing is visible arun so take a look at this uh look at the trends that are witnessed over here corporation tax how look at the trend so this is the estimates uh taxes on income which is taxes on income other than corporate tax so it is also showing an increasing trend gst is showing an increasing trend all of these are showing an increasing trend okay so um that answers your question so gst has been increasing but why is gst making so much of a news because gst was recently introduced and i say recently 2017 5 6 years ago it was introduced but in the larger scheme of things it is still a new concept we still haven't completely stabilized with respect to gst there are still states claiming that give us support give us compensation because we are getting used to the new system okay that which is why gst is frequently in the news not because it has overtaken corporate tax or other sources of taxes of income i hope that answers your question arun okay so let me uh, take a look at some other uh, yeah i will i will i will come i'll come to it uh, that's the next thing that i want to discuss um re versus be so it is here here itself uh, take a look at it roshan vignesh babu i don't know that's that's your name okay so every year when the budget, government announces the budget okay this is very basic information every year when the government announces the budget the government says what is going to be the expenditure pattern on february 1 2023 few months ago when the government announced the budget their main budget that they announce is for what is going to happen in the upcoming year what is going to be the taxes how much is going to be the borrowing so that is for the financial year starting from april 1 2023 which will go till march 31 2024 that is what is called as budget estimates you will notice that the government announced a very similar budget estimate for 2020 to 23 one year ago on february 1 2023 the government had announced a budget estimate sorry 2022 february 1 2022 the government had announced a budget estimate for 2000 21 sorry 22 23 on february 1 2022 for the upcoming year that is budget estimate so these are this is budget estimate from one year ago this is budget estimate at present okay this is budget estimate at present okay now coming to what is revised estimate now when the budget is presented for the year 2022 20 uh, sorry 23 24 which is the upcoming year 
they also have to say how they have done with respect to the last budget. So they had announced their budget one year ago, right? Did they do well? Did they stick to the budget? Because remember, budget estimate is a prediction for the future. It is not a fact. It is what is likely to happen. You are saying that next month I am going to spend this much. Towards the end of April, now you will sit and create a budget for May. But towards the end of May, you have to know whether you stuck to your budget or not. Otherwise, there is no accountability there. So what do they do? They want to find out what actually happened. But unfortunately, the year is going to end. 2022-23 is going to end only on March 31, 2023. But they are already presenting the budget on February 1st, which means they don't have the complete information. So what do they do? They look at the half year data from April to September or maybe till December and they publish a revised estimate for the last year, for the present year. Present year in the sense, uh, February 1 when they present, the, they are still in the year 2022-23. They revised the budget presented one year ago and they represent it. Okay? So that is the revised estimate. And then they will present the actual data for one year before that. So there are three data that is given there. A data for the upcoming year budget estimate. A data which revises the current estimate, which is revised estimate. And a data for the last year, which is actual estimates or actuals. I hope that clarifies your question. Uh, perfect. All right. So let me take a look at a couple of other questions as well. I don't, I'm not going to take up. I have got a boiled egg uh, answer to the boiled egg question, but I don't know authentically. So I think I'll have to leave it to you. Please figure it out because I don't know that very specific information. Uh, sir, this long document of a budget at glance is not showing in the Google search. Kindly assess. I think I've uh, shown it to you, Sashwata. I have not watched video of economic analysis of budget documents. Okay. That in fact, this budget at a doc. Yes, that is enough. Kiritik. I think you an analyze this particular document. I think that should be enough. Uh, in the question, second option, okay, done regarding uh, tax buoyancy. Does tax collection, will tax collection increase with better buoyancy? An increase in tax collection as a proportion of GDP is an indication of tax buoyancy. When the GDP increases by, let's say, 6%, if the tax revenue increases by more than 6%, that is buoyant tax. But if the GDP increases by 6%, but the tax revenue increases, but only by 3%, taxation system is not buoyant. So just because tax collection increases, you cannot claim the taxation system to be buoyant. Rajeshri, hope that clarifies your question. All right. Uh, I think I've answered all the questions that is there. Is it necessary to tally with the previous budget estimate and revenue expenditure? See, there is a concept. Please make a note of this. There is a concept called as Fiscal marksmanship, marksmanship, M A R K S M A N S H I P, marksmanship. So, what is meant by so in general English, what is the meaning of the word marksman? Who is a marksman? Marksman is someone who looks at a target and either shoots or bow and arrow. So, that is the person who is called as a marksman, someone who, who uh, aims at a target and hits it. That's a good marksman. Fiscal marksmanship means that. Whatever is the fiscal data presented by the government, for example, for in on February 1, 2023, the government has presented the data for the upcoming year. Fiscal marksmanship means the government being accurate with respect to their projection. They have projected a data. If the actual, if the reality is as close to their projection, the government is a good marksman or their budgeting is as good marksmanship associated with it. It need not always be the case. A lot of times there are variations. Take a look at the variation here. The budget estimate for gross tax revenue was 27 lakh 50, sorry, 27 lakh 57,000 crore. But the actual data was greater than that. Okay. So uh, the, take a look at the size of the budget itself. Uh, so total receipts, the projection was only 39 lakh crore. The reality, 41 not even the reality, because we will only know the reality one year later. So it need not always be the same. It need not always tally. Ideally, it should. If it does, that's what is called as fiscal marksmanship. If it doesn't, we are deviating from the fiscal targets that we have. Slightly deviating, which is not ideal. Okay. Lack of fiscal prudence is something that you might come across. Tables is one type of GSEC. Then why in the document they say GSEC and tables separately? Because what they refer to as GSEC is data GSEC. For convenience, when they generally refer to as GSEC, they might be referring to data GSECs. 
that is the reason why they separately refer to, they refer to g second table like that in general conversation colloquially when you use the word g sec they are referring to dated g sec long term tables is short term in nature that's why okay hope that is clear satish kumar here it's actually a very very important uh, relevant question that you asked technically g table is a g sec it doesn't make sense if you look at any rba document they will not randomly use the word g sec when they say g sec they require uh, include all borrowings of the government through uh, instruments but government uses it more generally that's why so the shen the word actual means what is the actual data for the previous year previous year present year upcoming year upcoming year is an estimation of the budget what is likely to happen present year is a revision of the budget past year alone you can present the actual data next year you will find that the actuals next year february 1 2024 you will find actuals for 2022 23 you will find the revised estimates for 2023 24 you will find budget estimates for 2024 25 that's what you will see in next year's document they don't need to give this data they are giving it so that we can look at it side by side and compare this data is not new this data is already there in last year's budget this data was presented here here in last year's budget they need not present it they have presented it so that you can read the budget estimate and revised estimate side by side for easy understanding hope that is clear okay all right perfect so i think we can proceed all right moving on next question take a look at it time starts All right, we are out of time. Not a very easy kind of question because it's not very common knowledge. There is a specific report called State Finances: A Study of Budgets. Consider the following observations and choose the correct ones as per the report. Okay, it's not very common. There is a reason why I ask this because this is something that has been in the news. Center, state fighting with each other. State center telling the states you are not doing a good job with respect to your finances. Only if you meet these targets, we'll provide you loan. All those things that the center is saying. The RBI itself flagged the financial position of many states. RBI said these 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 states are in trouble. It was there in the news. In the exam, you may get a very simple statement saying states finances. A study of budgets is published by which of the following organizations? Ministry of Finance, Reserve Bank of India. so it may be something i'm just making up a question it may be something as simple as that based on current affairs but we don't know so i have just taken up a random thing from the document just to convey to you that the document is important okay just a couple of interesting observations okay so states own tax is the major source of receipts and the aggregate receipts of all states and uts that's one statement second more than half the states failed to attain 14% gst revenue growth what is the significance of 14% that is a cut off which was kept by the gst council and said if you fail to attain 14 whatever you fail by will provide compensation to that extent okay that is what the gst council had promised that is why the 14 percentage cut off is important so i need to take the document now so i am doing it right in front of you so that you don't have to i mean again ask me where to find the document from so uh, uh what what was the name of the report it said a study of budgets right state finances state finances a study of budgets the most recent data rba directly go to whoever publishes rba data go to the document itself 
This is where you get the document from RBA's website. You have the entire document here: state finances, a study of budgets. Okay, you have overview, you have forward, you have all of those things. Why bother about anything else? Just download, get the entire document. taking a little bit of time to load as you can see yeah so this is the document now there is a very interesting part sometimes such questions are asked what is the theme capital formation in india the role of states that is the tagline associated but not sure upsc will go for that the role of capital formation so here is the one um so we have major sources of receipts right so we have introduction key fiscal indicators receipts and expenditures both the statements here were about receipts so let's go to page number four so that is where it's a big document i'm not going to look at all of them so you don't have to look at all of it either so this is gross fiscal deficit of i think uh, all states and uts with the legislature what is it for the entire states all states put together the deficit indicators for individual states you don't have to worry about this if there is something unique that is what you need to so this is the table based on which that that particular question is asked so there is revenue receipts of the revenue receipts the biggest share it is not given in percentage it's given in absolute terms it is given in lakh crore okay of and what exactly was the statement the statement is states own tax is the major source of receipts in the aggregate uh, receipts of so you have the entire receipts over here so revenue receipts separately non debt capital receipts separately is given of which you will notice that revenue receipts is this much 23.1 or you look at the most recent one 38.57 of that 38.57 okay you will notice that 21.11 is states own revenue but our question is specifically about states own uh, tax revenue states own tax revenue is still 17.87 not percentage lakh crore look at any other number that is there central transfer is overall but you in, in inside central transfer there is shareable taxes which is actually the state's own money and then grants in aid individually it's only 8 and 9 percentage but if you look at states own tax it is a major source this is an important data because conventionally we think state has very less in the form of source of collecting taxes so their source of money in the form of taxes is going to be very very minimal not true in fact state's own taxes is a big part of their own revenue their own receipts okay so to convey that which is which goes against our conventional knowledge okay which goes against our conventional knowledge so that is what is important over here everything else is very very small okay i told you a term earlier fiscal marksmanship you find the term over here okay and what are the two data which is compared budget estimate revised estimate so this is a measurement of statistically but not important for us this is a measurement of how far away they are from their projections okay so a lot of information like this is given then you have again receipts itself there is gst data which is given let me see where i can find it okay so maybe i'll go for the simpler option and look for there are quite a lot of references Okay. okay so we have it here okay so 10 states are expected to fall short of 14 percent gst growth as per their budget estimates okay the data is given here so why is that important because look at this there is an image that is associated with it states with less than 14 percentage growth in gst in 2022 23 okay so 
all that you need to know again don't memorize how many states and all those things look at it is it all the states in the country most of the states in the country no it is less than uh, half of the states that is there so only 10 states out of not only but it is still uh, not more than half so 10 states out of 28 are falling short 18 states are meeting the gst uh, target that is there now let me reiterate this is not the specific data that is important we can't guess what upsc asks from i have just taken two readily available information which is in the news as well states center state conflict that is there states feeling that they are not getting enough money from the center so we ask a question so what is the major source of centers re states revenue then the gst compensation is something that is again frequently in the news so how many states are actually benefiting out of the gst compensation 10 states out of 28 are no imagine that 20 states out of 28 we're having GST revenue less than 14 percentage. It makes no sense to cancel the GST compensation. And it makes all the sense to provide GST compensation for the further period of time. Because majority of states in that case, assuming that let's say 20 out of 28 states, were having a GST growth rate of less than 14 percentage. Then it makes sense to extend that. Now the center has not extended it. Why? What is the logic associated with it? Because 10 states out of 28 are the ones which are required. Okay. So uh, this is, again, certain observations. It's a very big document, 312 pages. I don't expect you to go through all of it, but take a look at the heading that is given over here, the index that is there. Take a look at the index and ask yourself, with a little bit of experience and preparation, you will be able to you know, give yourself certain parameters as to what you think is important. So take a look at the entire heading, just two or three pages. Look at what might be important among this. 99% of this document is going to be useful, useless. Okay, which means of 300 pages, 99% would be, um, say, let's say three pages. Other than three pages, everything else is fairly useless. So what are those three or maybe maybe 99% is too much. Say 10 pages out of 312 might be important for you to go through. But the question is, which are those 10 pages? Take a look at the index. Index may so certain parts of the document may interest you. Just go through, see if there is any graph or image or uh, data associated with it. Only when that is there, it makes sense. Although I have shown you inside paragraph, everything I show inside paragraph has a picture or an image associated with it. Okay, so that becomes important. How much is states borrowing? How much is the cumulative deficit that they have? Those might be the major things that you need to know about. Okay, so that is with respect to this particular question. That actually, sorry, that actually ends our entire part with respect to uh, public finance. I think that's a little bit more is there. So we'll move on then. Bharat Kumar, you have sent something which I'm not able to see. I'm only seeing it as a box. So I told you the answer here is A. Okay. One only. Moving on then. Time starts. How come only two people have answered for very, very less response? Time is out. Okay, now I'm getting a lot of answers. Fair enough. Okay, still very less. Only about 10 or 12 have answered. These are, skip. These are more like the current affairs that we expect from uh, UPC. Okay, all right. Um, great. So, one statement you should blindly assume it to be right. Look at the second statement. The proceed, Look at the heading, sovereign green bonds. Okay. Green bond, that name is enough. The proceeds are to be deployed in public sector projects which will help reduce economy's carbon intensity. Reduce economy's carbon intensity. Carbon intensity reduction means greening. That there should be no doubt about it. 
The next question is, is it going to be used in public sector projects? Look at the name sovereign. Sovereign means government. Government is borrowing. Government is going to use the money for public sector projects, most likely. So that is a logical guess. I don't think you should consider there is any logic for you. Tell me if there is any, but I don't think there is any logic by which the second statement can be considered as wrong. I don't know. A lot. Some people have answered A, not a lot. A few people have given A as answer, which is surprising for me. So two has to be correct. Now comes the type of trickery which uh, UPC sometimes follows. SGB's sovereign green bonds amounting to 1604 are to be issued as a part of government's overall market borrowing in the fiscal year 2022-23. If you apply a little bit of logic, you would know that 1600 crore is a very, very small sum. Okay, it's actually 16,000 crore. And this is precisely the type of mistakes that UPC makes in their question. Instead of 100, they'll give 1,000. Instead of 10,000, they'll give 100. Instead of 10,000, they'll give 1,000. So these are the kind of errors that they tend to make. And that is precisely why I removed from some one zero and put it over there. Everything else about it is correct. 1,600 is not the correct one. 16,000 crore is what is the correct one. Okay. So other than that, everything else is correct. So sovereign green bonds, the intention of the government is to borrow money to be used for public sector projects, which are green initiatives. So anything that has green initiative associated with it, that is what the intention for the government is. And this happened very recently. Only in 2023, January, they actually issued it, although it was announced in the last budget. So it is very recent current affairs as well. Okay. So uh, please read up a little bit. There is a framework on sovereign green bonds as well. I'm not going to go through the entire document, but there is something like that. There's something called as sovereign green bonds. There is a framework. Look at it. Department of Economic Affairs, the government document itself. I'm not expecting you to go through this 21 pages. is not much, but just the introduction or something like that, you can read to get an idea. So what, uh, what they have given insight is not necessarily related to green bond itself. They have given about nationally determined contribution goals and all those things and say that ultimately uh, the objective is to meet some of these targets. Okay, so that is all of the context. This is where the actual document starts from here. So this is what it starts. And uh, they have said, uh, what are the core components of green bond principles? How are they going to use it? Don't memorize any of this, please. Don't, it's not worth it. Just know, have a general idea. What is the amount? What is the general philosophy that they are going to adopt? That is enough. Okay. And without even studying all these things, you can understand green means it has to be some eco ecologically or environmentally friendly objective. Only thing, just do a normal Google search. You'll know the amount of money that they are trying to raise and all those things. Just some basic information is enough. You don't have to come to this document. I'm just showing you because there is an official source. Nothing wrong with coming here. Always rely on the best source, but you can also rely on PAB also. Let's see if there is a PAB document. I'm not sure. Uh, green bonds. Yeah, so PAB, sovereign green bond, 16,000 crore. What more do you need? Everything is there. Amounting to 16,000 crore. 8,000 has already been issued. 6th February 2023. Very recent news. Okay. Resources. Go government's overall borrowing. Deployed in public sector. Okay, <laughs> verbatim, whatever I have asked. Reduce economy's carbon intensity. Okay, maybe I should not have shown the source. I got caught using the same words. Okay, let's move on quickly from this area. I think that answers the question. The first statement alone is wrong. Okay. Next question. External sector. Almost done. All right.
which is correct uh, let me see a lot of people have said a a a a a okay since so many people are saying a i have to go with a a is the correct answer india has so far concluded 13 free trade agreements and 6 preferential trade agreements that's correct it's a factual thing second and third is almost correct because you have heard news that india has signed an agreement with uae india has signed an agreement with uh, australia both are free trade agreements the only error is it is interchange the sepa has been signed with uae comprehensive economic partnership agreement and ect economic cooperation and trade agreement has been signed with australia Uh, CEPA, from my understanding, is, has a much wider scope because it includes investment, it includes uh, mobility of workers. Yeah, all those things are included. Services are included inside that with the UAE one, which is which was in the news much more than what was in with respect to Australia. So that is interchange. C C CEPA uh, is with UAE, and uh, ECTA is with Australia. So both the statements, because they are interchange, they are wrong. A one only is the correct answer over here. Okay, the correct answer is A, uh, one only. Now, where do we get this particular data from? Again, the same uh, logic that you apply is don't go looking for this data. Just look for, let's say, trade agreements. And why am I? Why are we looking for it? Because UAE agreement was signed. Uh, because um, the Australia agreement was signed. Looking for PIB. So FTAs with respect to so here it is heading itself as it 2022 July which is still part of our information. Uh, so. In <laughs> again, India has signed 13 RTAs, regional trade agreements or free trade agreements with various countries that is given over here. Okay, at least uh, it is not verbatim. Okay. So, what are the various countries with which we have trade agreements? It is given over here. So, we have trade agreements with these entities. We have trade agreements. That list is given over here. What are the thirteen countries? Okay. So, as of the publishing of this, this was not implemented. So, with UAE and Australia, but subsequently it's been. In addition, India has also signed six preferential trade agreements, including Asia Pacific uh, trade agreement. so that is also given there so you will have another other places where you have the entire data that is given there now look at this cepa comprehensive economic partnership agreement is with united arab emirates and ecta economic cooperation and trade agreement is with australia so this one itself conveys all the information that is necessary for us pib uh, has all the data that is necessary let's also take a look at this yeah so here is the 13 plus 6 The thirteen is given over here. What are the various countries with which we have, and the six is given over here, with which we have preferential trade agreements. Okay, so I am not waiting for you to make notes or anything because you can find the source on your own. Um, so, what is the difference between free trade and preferential trade agreement? Um, so, preferential trade agreement means it's much limited in scope. So, if you are going into economic theory, uh, preferential trade agreement is the starting point. building up on top of that we'll get to free trade agreements then we have uh, common markets customs union and so on economic integration and all those things that happen later but more commonly you will have you will find preferential trade and free trade agreements what is the difference when two countries enter into preferential trade agreement they agree that on certain commodities alone they will have free trade so restricted free trade agreement so india and let's say india and some country signs a preferential trade agreement they say on this five commodities these five commodities or these 10 commodities alone we will uh, do the trading so this is what is called as creating a positive list so preferential trade agreements are associated or have a positive list associated with them what is a positive list a list of items on which preferential trade or free trade would happen okay on all other items it is normal no free trade no preferences on these select items alone there will be preferential trade or free trade between the two countries whereas when it comes to a free trade agreement their agreement is like this on all the goods and services that the goods and services it depends sometimes it's goods only sometimes it's services uh, services also like we saw with sepa and ect so on all the commodities there will be free trade except a list of items on these items we are not going to allow because we want to protect our domestic industry okay so though that is what is called as a negative list where everything is under free trade 
except this list of items. Okay, so negative list. Preferential trade agreement has a positive list associated with it. Free trade agreement has a negative list associated. Okay, so conceptually, this is something for us to note as well. Okay, the answer here is A, one only. Moving to the next question. So we are going to have a series of uh, external sector questions. Time starts. Okay, time out. Uh, a lot of people have given me the correct answer. The correct answer here is uh, B, uh, two only. B is correct, not C, B. So let's uh, take a look at the data associated with it. Economic survey, external sector. And made a few markings, which is so. How did I get to this? I showed you earlier, right? I went to just type external sector, scroll down, you will find the external sector chapter over there. So you will find the document over there. Um, okay, so first basic information that you have is during this fiscal, India's exports have displayed resilience on the back of record levels of exports. What are the key export items that we have? Petroleum products, gems and jewelers, organic and inorganic chemicals, drugs and pharmaceuticals were among leading export items. Please make a note. What are the leading export items of India? Okay. Similarly, do we have anything about imports? Apart from elevated crude oil prices, the revival of economic activity contribute to increase. Okay. Petroleum, crude and imports. Petroleum, crude and products. Electronic goods, coal, coke and briquettes. Uh, etc. Machinery, electrical, non-electrical, gold were among the top import items. Please make a note of that as well. Okay, a very general thing. Balance of payments encountered pressures during the year under review, which means balance of payments did not do particularly well. Okay. Sharp rise in oil prices resulted in widening current account deficit not cushioned by invisible receipts policy tightening by federal reserve we are going to discuss that and strengthening of us dollar led to fpa outflows okay as a result surplus in capital account was lower than current account deficit leading to depletion of forex on bop basis forex has been reducing we have been seeing that in the news as well so this is just from the first page the italicized one all our key information is taken up that's it you don't have to go any deeper into the economic survey in general. But let's take a look at what is given over here as well with respect to trade, the merchandise trade. What exactly is the question that we have asked? The question is uh, exports of petroleum oil and lubricants constitutes lubricants constitute about half of the total exports in terms of value. Petrol, oil and lubricants exports constitute around 20%. And non POL exports, petroleum oil lubricants, constitute around 80% of the exports during that particular year. Okay. It continued to be the most exported commodity. Owing to the rise in global crude prices, petroleum products continued to be the most exported commodity in India's context, followed by gems and jewelers, organic chemicals, drugs, and pharmaceuticals. But still, to say that it contributes half of uh, India's exports is an exaggeration. So we know petroleum oil and lubricants is a significant part. It is the highest. It occupies the number one position when it comes to exports also. Crude oil, we import. Refined petroleum, we export. Petroleum products, we export. We also import petroleum products, some kinds of petroleum products. But it's not half. Half is an exaggeration. Half is too much. So that is what makes the first statement wrong. Second statement is correct. 
it contributes one third or it accounts for one third of the value. Uh, energy demand may be pushing India's imports. Yes. So petroleum. Um, so energy demand may be pushing India's imports for fuel, including coal and petroleum oil lubricants, whose share rose to 37.1 percentage. It says more than one third, more than 33 percentage. Other principal imports included uh, electronic goods, coal, coke, briquettes, machinery, whatever we saw earlier. Okay, so that is uh, what is of significance roughly. So look at how the question is framed one third, not 37 percentage, around one third, more than one third. So that is how the question is looked at. So petroleum, we know you would have heard of a concept called as windfall taxes, which was in the news. That is again in the context of the same thing. Now, because of the global rise in fuel prices, when we bought, we bought at a lower price. Before the war broke out, we bought at a lower price. Then we were refining. When we sold, the petroleum prices have gone so high that the petroleum companies were making huge profits. This unexpected, unanticipated sudden gains is what is called as windfall, windfall gains. W-I-N-D-F-A-L-L, -L, windfall. Windfall means something that is unexpected and huge. Okay, Sudden huge gains is windfall, windfall gains, windfall uh, profits. When the petroleum companies got those windfall profits, the government introduces, introduced a new tax called as windfall gains tax or windfall tax, which means you are making unexpected gains. On those unexpected gains, I am going to tax you more than what I usually do. But once your gains normalize, you will not collect those taxes anymore. Only because you are getting windfall gains, we are collecting windfall tax. So windfall tax is also something that you saw in the news. In the context of that, they may not ask a question about windfall tax. They may ask a question about the data that is related. To them. Or they may ask a windfall gains uh, or tax question itself. We don't know. Okay, But that is how we interpret data. That is why POL becomes very important because there is global, there is war with Russia or sorry, not war with Russia. Russia and Ukraine is uh, war is going on. Um, Russia has become the major supplier of petroleum products or petroleum, crude petroleum for India, replacing other your Gulf nations and some other uh, nations that were there. So all these are of significance. This is what you see in the news. The question may be about any of this. Okay. So uh, let me take a look at if there's any question that is left or left unanswered. Moving on. So the answer here is first one is wrong. Second one is right. Two only B is the answer. Moving to the next one. Time starts. I've got only two answers out of 100 odd people. Now it's four answers, slowly increasing. Time has run out. We'll wait for a few more seconds. All right. So um, I know at this point, some of you are thinking, why are all the questions so much about data and all those things? I told you in the beginning of the session itself, my intention is not to cover everything that is there in current affairs. My intention is to cover those areas which you may otherwise miss out on. You may not focus on these areas only not only those areas, those are some of the areas which I picked up and this interpretation of data or collecting data is something that you may not ready be it, it may not be readily available with you, which is why I'm picking these areas and I'm explaining it to you. Okay. Don't think that this is what see some of you, especially if you're preparing for the first time, you would have prepared so much of concepts, and then now you come here in the session and everything is all data. Is that how UPC is going to ask? No, that is not how UPC is going to ask. These are just to help you fill in those areas which you may not have covered already. This one session is not sufficient to cover the entire current affairs. 
I told you that in the beginning itself. So I'm picking on areas which I feel that you might have missed out on. Okay. Anyway, so the answer here is, let's take a look at the statement. Consider the following statements about external debt of India based on the data from economic survey. Um, short term debt accounts for around one fifth of the total debt. Okay. So that is again a very uh, data driven question. Short term debt means debt that we have to repay in a period of uh, one year, within one year. So it's an external debt analysis kind of question. UPC has asked such questions in the past. In what currency is most of India's dollar denominated? Those kind of questions. Short term versus long term. Something that is asked. Then second, India's total external debt obligations is in excess of foreign exchange reserves, which is very hard to believe, but that is true. In fact, both the statements here are true. 13, the answer is C, both 1 and 2. We will take a look at the data that is associated with it. Same external sector chapter, economic survey. We'll go to debt. Capital account is where we have debt. So we have reached debt. Although I have picked debt, don't focus on debt alone. You have FDI, net FDI. Is it showing an increasing trend, decreasing trend? You have a capital account balance. You have composition of capital account. What is the direction? All those are observations that you can make. Net FPI, it is showing a negative trend during certain parts, but all of these are quarterly. Just make a note of this. All these are also important. I just happen to have picked up uh, about, this is Forex resource about um, debt. That's all. Okay, so did I cross debt? I think I might have crossed debt. No, no, external debt is here. Okay, external debt. Uh, there are two data, two tables. Okay, this is the table that based on which the question is. Okay, uh, this is how much our external debt is across the, oh, sorry, over the years. This table, external debt. Uh, this is the table, external debt. In US, a billion, that is how usually it is denominated, not in rupees. Usually it is in US dollars. So, uh, end of September, so somewhere around 600 billion US dollars. Ratio of external debt to GDP, roughly around 20 percentage. Okay. Debt service ratio, our capability to uh, service and the amount that we have to pay during a given period of time. Ratio of forex reserves to external debt. So, 96.5 or 87.3 or 98. There's only one period where you will find a number greater than 100. What does greater than 100 mean? Look at the heading ratio of forex to total debt. Forex on top, total debt at the bottom. Only when forex is greater than total debt will be will it be greater than 100. Based on the latest data, the most recent data that we have, it is lesser than 100. For most years, you will notice that it is lesser than 100, which means most of the times, Forex is lesser than what is our total debt, which means we don't have enough money in our reserves to repay all our loan. However, look at this. This is where the first statement becomes important. Ratio of short-term debt to Forex reserves. Ratio of short-term debt is only around 20 percentage. So ratio of short-term debt to total debt, it's only around 20 percentage, which means our immediate repayment obligations, we have enough money in our forex reserves, even if nothing else works, we can take our forex reserves, 20 percentage of our forex reserves we, re we pay, our short-term debt is done. Short-term debt means within one year what we have to repay. Everything else is long-term obligation. So we have signed a contract with Japan, let's say, where they are giving us money, which we have to repay over 30 years. They cannot come next year and suddenly say, no, no, we need money, give it back. No, loan agreement is signed. There is no way that they can ask us the money before time. It is not possible, which means that having long-term debt is good. It is sustainable debt. Having high short-term debt is troublesome. So what was our question here? Our question was short-term debt accounts for around one-fifth of the total debt, 20 percentage of the total external debt that is there. The question itself is about external debt. So, 1 for 20 percentage is correct. See, Kirtik, uh, the question is, consider the following statements. So, what is the uh, what is Kirtik's question here is, um, here short-term debt accounts for around 1 fifth of the total debt, right? 
So to sorry, uh, total debt. The question is, is it total debt of the country as a whole or is it total external debt alone? You don't have to worry about that because look at the question. The question says, consider the statements about external debt of India, which means both the statements are about external debt, which means what they refer to as total debt here is total external debt of the country. If it is ambiguous, this is how you have to make sense of it. Okay. Uh, but our, okay, so I'll answer. There is one more question that has come in. I'll answer that also. So this is short term debt accounts for around one fifth of the total debt. That is correct. India's total external debt obligation is in excess of forex reserves. That is also correct. We just saw as per the data from the economic survey, most recent data. So both the statements are correct. Now, there is a question which uh, Rajesh Shekharan also, now uh, I think that clarifies your question. The question itself says about external debt of India. So it is about external debt. Even when we say total debt, the question, larger question is about external debt. Okay. Hope that clarifies that particular query. And now Satish Kumar's question. Sir, but our external debt is only 10 percentage we saw before. No, it is not 10 percentage. It is 1 percentage, Satish Kumar, not 10 percentage. Of the total borrowing of the government of India, government's borrowing from outside India was only 1 percentage. That is government's borrowing. Government's external debt is different. A country's external debt is different. Again, to convey that point, take a look at this table. The table that is given before. What are the sources of or who is the one who is borrowing? External debt outstanding. Of the total outstanding external debt, general government borrowing, which means center plus state. How can state borrow? Center borrows on behalf of the states for these developmental projects, metro construction, all those things, central bank borrowing, corporations. But if you look at it, the most important uh, contributor towards this borrowing is financial corporations, private entity, uh, entities, external commercial borrowings. That is what is a big, big percentage of the borrowing. Okay. So the question, Satish Kumar, earlier, was about government's internal and external debt. This question is about external debt in general. What is the difference between government's external debt and country's external debt? Uh, Karthikeyan, if you as an individual happen to borrow from a foreign bank, if it is possible, then that was also a part of external debt in the balance of payments transaction. Look, see, for all of these things, what you have to understand is the definition of balance of payments. So how do we define balance of payments? Balance of payments is a record of transactions of all residents of India with the rest of the world and vice versa. All residents of India, not only the government. So in the balance of payments, we have current account and capital account. And in the capital account is what we have loans. That loan is what is the external debt over here. Who all could be borrowing? Government could be borrowing. But private corporations could also be borrowing. Okay. Sometimes it is easier to raise money from a foreign country. Why? Because we have, we know this particular logic. Most of you know this logic. We have discussed this in class many times. Okay. Same logic that I've discussed before. I'll ask you a question. Which country is likely to have a higher rate of growth? Developed country or developing country? We have discussed this previously. The answer is developing country is likely to have a higher rate of growth or has the potential to have a higher rate of growth. Why? Because a lot of untapped potential. Correct, Rajeshekaran Mithilesh. Correct. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Karthik. Correct. So they are the ones who are likely to have a higher rate of growth. And because the rate of growth is going to be higher in developing countries, the demand for money is going to be greater in developing countries because more businesses need money. When the demand for money is higher, the rate of interest is also going to be higher. So if an Indian company wants to borrow from India, they have to pay a higher interest. What is the repo rate in India? Somewhere around 6 percentage, 6, 6.5 percentage. What is the equivalent of the repo rate in European and, uh, countries and in America? Somewhere around 1 percentage or 2 percentage. Which means borrowing from foreign countries is much, much cheaper. So a lot of corporations in India, there is, I agree, there is a risk of depreciating Indian currency because the profits made by the Indian companies in Indian rupees. When they have to repay, they have to repay in foreign currency. There is an exchange rate risk that is associated with it. But if the exchange rate risk is not major, then it is quite possible that a lot of Indian corporations will try to borrow from foreign sources because the rate of interest is very, very low. 
So private corporations borrow, external commercial borrowings, government borrowing, NRA deposits that come into banks are also treated as loans. All of these are other than government sources of borrowing. So that is where external debt is different. External debt is a much bigger concept. Government borrowing from outside India is a much smaller concept within it. Okay. Hope that clarifies it. Thus, government external borrowing is lesser than forex. Government external borrowing is lesser than forex. Yes, Sadesh Kumar, that is correct. Okay. All right. Got it. Great. I think I have answered. Uh, the, if there is any pending question, please let me know. Moving on to the next question. Time starts. Okay, why is the time not running out? Maybe I clicked something which made the time not run out. Okay, time will run out. Okay, so I happen to, there is a Q&A part here, which where I happen to miss uh, looking at the answers. Sorry about that. Um, right from the beginning, I happen to have missed out on that. Okay, so let's take a look at What's given? Consider the following statements about effective exchange rate. Effective exchange rate is a summary indicator of movements of the home currency against a basket of currencies of trading partners. Rear is the near adjusted by relative prices captured by inflation differentials between home country and trading partners. OEA, Office of the Economic Advisor, compiles and disseminates both the trade and export weighted indices of near and rear. Okay. So, a uh, lot of answers. It says B, A, a is the dominant answer. Okay, fair enough. C is also given as an answer. We mug up the country names. Uh, Tamar, I don't, uh, regarding the earlier question, I don't think you need to mug up as such, but you have a general idea with respect to so neighboring countries. If you happen to have an agreement with a neighboring country, it becomes important. So don't just blindly memorize it, but have a general idea about it. Okay, so the answer to this particular question now, coming to the question at hand, uh, EER, uh, EER, so the reason why we have this question as significant and last year also UPC had asked a question, it's because uh, the, the RBA recently, uh, a year back, made a change with respect to the uh, countries which are included in this basket of currencies. So first of all, there is a concept called as exchange rate. Uh, exchange rate in general means the value of Indian rupee in the Indian context, the value of Indian rupee against one particular foreign country's currency. A, a comparison of two currencies is the con conventional exchange rate that we have. What is effective exchange rate? So India wants to understand the competitiveness of the Indian currency, trade competitiveness or ex export competitiveness of Indian rupee. So what do we do? We look at our major trading partners. Okay. So Indian rupee is compared with every single major trading partner, let's say 40 countries. I think the recent list has 40 countries inside it. Okay, Indian rupee versus the 40 major trading partners of India. Now, each trading partner has their own relative importance, right? Some countries more important, some countries less important. So, Indian rupee versus US dollar and USA is given assigned a certain weightage. So, based on that weightage, their value will be a proportion of that weightage. Let's say 50 percentage is the, assume 50 percentage is the weightage given for US dollar, then value, US dollar's value will be reduced to half. Just like how our uh, price index, CPA, WPA, just like how those are calculated, 
weightages are, are assigned for the various trading partners of india and a cumulative values arrived as 1 rupee is equal to this much value okay so that is what is called as effective exchange rate it is a summary indicator of movements of the home currency against a basket of trading partners the first statement is correct okay second one rear is near adjusted for relative prices adjusted by relative prices captured by inflation differentials between home country and trading partners it is something that you should be answering without even knowing what is near and rear because it's only a question of real versus nominal real is equal to nominal adjusted for inflation is general logic that you should be knowing whenever you come across real and nominal what is the difference inflation is the difference nominal is adjusted for inflation you will get real value in inflation so the second statement is also correct okay so one and two are correct the only question is is it a or is it d office of the economic advisor is not the one which compiles and disseminates the data it is the reserve bank of india which disseminates both the data okay so that is the error over there so third statement is wrong one and two are correct okay hope that answers uh, this particular question some people had answered uh, c i don't know why you think uh, a first statement is wrong logically okay uh explain near and rear oh i just did that no so indian rupee is there so indian rupee compared to a basket of currencies okay so this is what is effective exchange rate this effective exchange rate is what is called as near nominal effective exchange rate when see indian rupee versus us dollar inside that basket if you take into account Indian rupees, uh, sorry, India's inflation versus the foreign countries, uh, USA's inflation and calculate that. And similarly, for every single country, if you take India's price index versus their price index, that will be called as rear. Near and rear is different simply that in rear, normal, uh, inflation is taken into consideration. In near, that is not taken into consideration. Okay. For, I, it is not very important uh, to go into the mathematical details of this. Okay. Weightage is not assumed. Weightage is actually calculated. RBA does the calculation of weightage. Okay. Just take a look at this. Uh, near, uh, EER. EER. RBA. So there is. This is how you search for things. Okay. Effective exchange rate of the Indian rupee. This was in January 21, 2021. A couple of years ago now. Existing basket is expanded from 36 to 40 countries. With the inclusion of eight new currencies and exclusion of four currencies. That is why it was in the news. Okay. So, what are the weightages that are assigned? Export trade based weightage. The weightage is given over here. This is uh, to answer Sudarshan. Export weight based weightage is given over here. Okay. Uh, in the previous and the present. So, the two things are given over here. What are the 80, 40 currencies that are there? Eventually, a value. The formula for calculating near normal effective exchange rate. So this is how it is calculated. Let's take one particular country. Let's take USA. So E is the exchange rate of, um, let's say what is given as E over here. Um, so E is Indian currencies exchange rate uh, in comparison to, so it is always a comparison. So what they are using as the reference point is IMF's currency. IMF has a currency called as special drawing rights. It's almost like a currency for them. So E is the uh, exchange rate of rupee against the SDR divided by the exchange rate of the foreign currency against the SDR. So it is between that E by EI. And then there is, it is, there is a square root in terms of the weightage that is assigned to that particular country. This mathematics is not important. I'm just trying to convey to you, it is a comparison between two currencies and a basket of that. Look at this, it is given as i is equal to 1 to n. 1 to n refers to the 40 countries. i is equal to 1 to 40. For every single country, we do this and cumulatively everything is added. And that is what is referred to as near. Now, what is the difference between near and rear? The formula is almost identical. We only have p. p is the price index in India. pi is the price index in the foreign country. So, when you take that also into consideration, the comparison of the prices in the two countries, then that becomes rear, real effective exchange rate. So, if you want, if you are mathematically oriented, it's not important for UPC exam. If you want to really, really understand this concept, you can probably go through this. Or just simply read up the basics of it and that should be enough. Okay. Right. So, 
someone is asking without any name us upsc prep it says sir the recent news on moving away from us dollar being global exchange currency and looking at the agenda of countries like russia and china being pro yuan and bangladesh agreeing to get on to trade with russia in yuan for new plant installation if at all there is a pandemonium uh, sorry predominant shift considering <laughs> in the exchange currency and relationship with china russia with respect to india as contrasting one is a close friend and another is a close aggressive neighbor how will india's position of stance be in the case how will it affect our global trade um yeah so we don't see i'll give you a one line answer so the question is essentially if us dollar ceases to be a global currency and if russian currency or chinese currency becomes a global currency what is its implications on india simple answer is we don't know we can't guess what might happen we don't know whether we will continue to have a poor relationship with china forever yesterday you saw on news india and china have agreed to sort out the differences once our border agreements are uh, or disagreements are sorted out if and there is nothing which cannot be sorted if it is sorted out okay then india and china may not be you know aggressive enemies once again we it, it could become indo chini bye bye like we believed it was prior to the 1961 war you never know there are never permanent allies or enemies usa tried to negotiate with north korea no it almost seemed like there was some result that was going to happen did not happen but you can never know so you can never guess what can happen it's a very hypothetical question which won't lead us anywhere okay don't be worried about the time i know the time is till 8 o'clock i know we have finished only half the number of remaining questions doesn't go into this much of uh, detailed analysis and all those things much simpler questions are in store okay welcome nameless person okay moving on next question time starts has started Okay, so we are out of time. Uh, what is Nostro? Nostro in the news because of precise issue that uh, the person was addressing. The answer here is uh, D. All three statements given here are correct. It is just an explanation uh, concept. I wanted you to know what it is. So this is how it works. Okay, imagine uh, two banks are there. There is State Bank of India. and let's say there is an equivalent bank in australia or let's take russia itself there is a russian bank because russia and india is where the context of the news is okay so what is a wastro account it is one that a domestic bank holds sbi in india holds an account for a foreign bank the russian bank holds an account in india okay in indian rupee for example an indian oil company buys oil from russia so we have to pay them but now us dollar is not allowed usa is saying that we won't allow uh, anyone to transact with russia in us currency so we are in an advantageous position we tell russia we will pay in indian rupee russia says okay fine as long as you buy it's okay so what will russia do with indian rupee absolutely nothing so russia says you keep it in your account in india later when we buy something from you you can take that money from there rather than russia paying us separately they'll see deducted from this account so sbi holds an account for the russian bank okay where the russian money is kept inside sbi's account that is a wastro account a wastro account is one that a domestic bank holds for a foreign bank in domestic bank's currency we call this account as wastro what will the russian bank call this account as the russian bank will call the same account as a nostro account now look at the same account from the russian bank's perspective nostro account is one that a foreign bank for russia sbi is foreign bank agreed from russian perspective from russian perspective the same account that sbi is holding is sbi is a foreign bank now held for a domestic bank the russian bank is the domestic bank in the foreign bank's currency indian rupee it is maintained so the same account is what is referred to as wastro as well as nostro from the account holders perspective india holds the account 
Indian bank holds the account, India will call it as a Vostro account. The same account, Russia will refer to it as a Nostro account. Let's say we buy something from Russia and, uh, sorry, uh, Russia buys something from us and instead of paying in US dollar, they are saying we'll pay in Russian currency. What will we do with Russian currency? No other country may accept it. So we say keep the money with them you, yourself. So then we'll call that account to be Vostro. They will call, sorry, Nostro. They'll call it to be Vostro. So it is just interchange. It's the same account. When we call it, we refer to as Vostro. When they refer to the same account, they'll call it as Nostro. Okay. So the first two statements are explanations. In the Indian context, more usage of Vostro account helps in internationalization of rupee. More Vostro means that more and more people or more and more countries are okay with transacting in rupee. Look at the first statement. Vostro account, foreign bank holds an account in the domestic bank in domestic bank's currency. So if more Vostro account is opened in India, it means that more and more countries are accepting Indian currency for transactions, which means greater international use of rupee. That is what we refer to as internationalization of rupee or usage of rupee in international transactions. So all three statements are correct. In a very similar sense, we have one more question coming up. Take a look at it. Time starts. All right, so time done. Let's take a look at it. It is a process, internationalization of rupee. It is a process that involves increasing the use of local currency in cross-border transactions. It's correct. It increases the exchange rate risk on domestic traders. In fact, it is the opposite. When does the exchange rate risk come in when we are dealing in foreign currency? If there is an ex uh, if there is a depreciation of Indian currency, then payment in foreign currency becomes that much harder. Okay, so the exchange rate risk on domestic traders is greater if you are dealing in foreign currency, whereas if you are dealing in Indian currency, the risk is reduced to a large extent. So second statement is wrong. It decreases the exchange rate risk on domestic traders is the correct answer. Then 16, it may limit, uh, sorry, third statement, it may limit India's ability to anchor monetary policy to its domestic economic landscapes. Now, this is a problem which a country like USA also faces. Their currency is internationally used for transactions. They cannot arbitrarily reduce or increase the money supply without considering international implications. So similarly, if Indian currency becomes broadly used outside or widely used outside, then we have to not just look at the domestic conditions. We have to look at the international impact of changing our money supply as well. Okay, Because it will have a great impact globally. So it limits our ability to anchor monetary policy to domestic landscapes because international aspects will also come into the picture. Third statement is correct. Answer is B, 1 and 3 only. Second statement is wrong. Okay. So it's an extension of the previous question in that sense. Okay. So earlier there was a question that uh, near is equal to rear minus inflation. Am I right? It is not minus inflation. Adjusted for inflation is the right term. Anonymous attendee. Hope that clarifies. I know I'm answering it a little late still. Okay. Uh, so 17th question. Time starts. We are moving on to the last, I think, in exchange rate. Okay, we have run out of time. 
So if I didn't mention answer to the previous one, 16th one, the answer is uh, B, 1 and 3. Second one is wrong, I had said. Okay, anyway, 17. Now, um, I've, again, a very uh, conceptual kind of a question, but based on current affairs, US Federal Reserve had actually interest, increased interest rates. What would happen? You, you saw that in the external sector document that I showed as well. Um, the um, economic survey document on external sector also had this in the uh, paragraph, highlighted paragraphs. So US Federal Reserve increases the interest rate. So foreign investors are thinking, we came to India thinking India is providing higher returns. Now USA itself is providing comparatively higher returns. Let's go back to USA. Capital flight happens. So when they take their foreign currency outside, there is a greater demand for foreign currency because they are asking, they are investing and doing everything in Indian currency. When they go back, they want their foreign currency back. So there is an increased demand for foreign currency within India. When the demand for foreign currency is greater than the supply, what happens? Indian currency starts depreciating. Previously, people were willing to pay only 80 rupees to get a dollar. Now, because of the high demand, they're having to pay 85 or 90 or 95 rupees. Depreciation of Indian rupee happens. To prevent this situation, what is RBI's likely reaction when, is, when Federal Reserve raises the interest rates? India has to offer a, an even higher uh, return for the investors to prevent the capital flight. So, RBI is also likely to raise the repo rate in uh, as a reaction to the Federal Reserve's action. So all four are possibilities over here. Most people have answered the, given the correct answer for 17, which is which shows that you have good hold over the concept. All four are correct. 16, sorry, 18. We are moving on to inflation. Very good. Salai Siva Sigaran from Mayveri Salai, are you? I wonder. Great. I have a friend from there. Okay, so 18th, uh, yeah, so time out, 18th answer is correct, A, again, most people have answered it. I think you guys are quite strong, most of you who are attending are quite strong with your concepts because concept questions, you are getting it right. It is part of liquidity adjustment facility, yes, there are two main tools of liquidity adjustment in India right now, repo rate and standing deposit facility, but as a corridor, when you look at it, there is a third thing also which is added, which is the uh, marginal... Um, standing facility okay so if you are looking at it as a corridor there is a repo rate in the middle 0 0.25 percentage points greater than that is the marginal standing facility 0 0.25 percentage points lesser than that is the standing deposit facility if repo rate is 6 percentage msf is 6.25 sdf is 5.75 that's how it is linked so it acts as the floor of the laf corridor msf acts as the ceiling of it repo rate is in the middle it is the anchor Okay, so it is a part of the framework, access flow is correct. It is a collateral based tool for absorbing excess liquidity from the economy. Reverse repo rate was a collateral based tool. But because this is the standing facility, which means RBI says it is available at any time you want. Whenever you want, you can come and deposit money with RBA. RBI says we will not give any collateral to you. So it is a collateral free tool, not collateral based. It is a tool without collateral as someone has rightly explained as well. Aravind has rightly explained does not need collateral, correct. Its regular operation will be at the discretion of RBI. Repo rate, reverse repo rate works on the discretion of RBI. Reverse repo rate is not used anymore. MSF, SDF, look at the word standing. Standing means available at all times. RBI doesn't have to explicitly make it available. So it's a standing facility. Both the standing facilities are not at the discretion of RBI. Of course, RBI is the one which introduces it. But once it introduces it, it is available for the banks at any point of time till the RBI makes any change to this. So it's a standing facility. It's a regular operation. will not be at the discretion of RBI. Banks decide whether to deposit money or not. Only the first statement is correct. Okay. So A1 only. Moving on. 19. Time starts. SDF recently, Shabas, uh, it, re it replaced reverse repo rate as the floor. SDF replace reverse repo rate. 
repo is still there, right in the middle. If I said something wrong, please uh, forgive me. In a flow, I might have said, if I said SDF replace repo, that is a mistake from my part. Okay, during brief it all right, no problem. Timeout, monetary transmission mechanism. So what is monetary transmission mechanism? So still getting answers. Uh, first one, the introduction of external benchmark based lending rate was aimed at improving the transmission of monetary policy through the economy. Okay, repo rate is a better tool at regulating economy wide money supply, while OMO helps in immediate regulation of money supply. Okay, so the answer here is both the statements are correct. C is the answer. A lot of people initially answered it correct. Some people later said B is correct. And I have got one person. No, all the answers are either C or uh, B. So C is the correct answer. So let's look at what is monetary transmission mechanism. RBA introduces monetary policy, which is repo rate. But what is repo rate? It is a rate of interest at which RBA lends money to banks. So it's a relationship between RBA and bank. Through it, we think RBA can only adjust the money supply in the banking system. That is not true. Because when the repo rate changes, the rate of interest at which banks borrow from other places, including from the public also raises, the rate of interest at which bank lends money to the people also increases. When RB reduces the repo rate, all the other interest rates are also likely to go down. This is called as transmission of monetary policy to the rest of the economy. Okay. So when monetary transmission mechanism, monetary policy is transmitting properly to the economy, then RBS policies are a success. The whole idea of repo rate is to transmit the monetary policy to the economy. When that was not happening properly, prior to 2019, the RBA, it was there in the economic survey as well. The RBA had reduced the repo rate by 135 basis points, but the banks had only reduced their lending rate by 40 basis points or something like that. That is poor monetary transmission. To overcome that, RBA said, we have a system called as marginal cost of funds based lending rate, MCLR. For certain kinds of loans, RBA replaced MCLR with EBLR, external benchmark based lending rate. MCLR was based on internal factors of the bank, like their cost of borrowing and all those things, their operational cost and all those things. External benchmark is based on the repo rate and a couple of other external factors like that. So once it is based on repo rate, when repo rate changes, external benchmark based lending rate also raises by the same extent. Uh, repo rate falls by the same extent, EBLR also falls. So it was aimed at improving the transmission of monetary policy through the economy. So first statement is correct. Linking the rate at which banks give loan to the common people with an external factor like repo rate was intended to improve the monetary policy, transmission of monetary policy. Second, open market operation, RB announces next week, Friday, we are going to borrow 10,000 rupees from the market or sell G6 worth 10,000 crores from the market. Immediately, they can reduce the money supply or increase the money supply in the economy through open market operation. But most of the people who deal with securities are limited. Very few people are actually dealing with it. So commercial banks deal with it or non-banking financial companies deal with it. Very few people deal with government securities, which means that they can immediately reduce the money supply, but only from select segments of the economy, not an economy-wide change. For an economy-wide change, repo rate changes, repo rate increases, banks' lending rate increases, Banks' deposit rate also increases. As a result, more people deposit. Common people also deposit more, more money into the banks. They borrow less money from the bank. So a greater economy-wide impact can be seen through repo rate. So the second statement is also correct. That's why both the statements here are correct. Okay. So I hope uh, that, answer, uh, that answer is clear. Moving to the 20th question. EVLR, MCLR is confusing. So Satish Kumar, the idea is very simple. EBLR. Okay, external benchmark based lending rate right? could be a typo, I think. So EBLR is very simple. So MCLR, bank looks at their internal factors. So how much, at what rate did I borrow? How much salary do I have to pay to my staff? How much is the rent on the building? All those are the factors which determine MCLR, internal factors of bank. It is, you can also understand MCLR as internal benchmark based lending rate. But now RBA is saying, if I leave it to you to decide what is the lending rate, 
you are not doing it properly you are not passing on the monetary policy properly so we are going to do something you decide a margin this much more you want you fix that margin and after that the interest rate will change according to repo rate so repo rate becomes the uh, indicator whatever is the repo rate plus 4 percentage will be the lending rate okay repo rate increases lending rate also increases same way repo rate decreases lending rate also decreases the same way that is external benchmark for a bank repo rate is external for a bank their cost is internal that is the external and internal concept over here pratish kumar hope that is clear next question 20 time starts simple question for most people late satish all right so surprisingly i am getting a lot of wrong answers time out right so yeah uh, the answer here is 1 uh, and 1 uh, and 2 c is the correct answer over here a lot of people seem to have missed out on this stagflation means stagnation accompanied by inflation there is stagnation in the economy there is inflation in the economy simultaneously the phillips curve theory or a general theory with respect to inflation is that inflation is likely to provide more profits as a result more production would happen so when inflation happens gdp is likely to grow which is why india is also targeting we need minimum 4 percent is inflation so that our gdp rises accordingly so that businesses produce more but the scenario where you have high levels of inflation but it is happening because of increasing cost of production and the cost of production is rising businesses are saying sorry we don't have money to produce more so an inflation accompanied by a stagnation or a drop in gdp growth or a stagnation in gdp growth is called as stagflation so inflation accompanied by a lack of gdp growth is correct skewflation skewed inflation in some sectors alone there is inflation while other sectors are largely remaining unaffected let's say food prices alone are rising all other areas are remaining low fuel prices alone are rising all other sectors are remaining fairly uh, stable that is skewflation skewed inflation is skewflation so it is correctly matched inflation specific to only some sectors then you have disinflation disinflation is different deflation is different what is the definition given there is deflation decrease in the prices of goods and services is deflation what is disinflation decrease in the rate of inflation let's say india in india there is inflation of 8 percentage but we want inflation to be brought down to 4 percentage if we bring down the rate of inflation it is it doesn't mean that the price is falling it means that the rate of growth of the price of the commodity is falling not the price of the commodity itself so all the the repo rate increase that the rbi is doing when they are increasing the repo rate from 6 to 6.5 or whatever it is those are measures to control inflation right their intention is not to bring about deflation their intention is to bring about disinflation in the economy reduce the rate of inflation from 6 percentage to 4 percentage so disinflation is different deflation is different so here the answer is c 1 and 2 only so how is it if petrol increases most of things okay with petrol yes if petrol price rises most other prices will rise but not necessarily true with respect to food items if there is poor monsoon uh, food items uh, prices will rise it need not result in industrial products price rising also it is not common skewflation is not common usually all sectors rise together but sometimes it may happen that one sector alone rises the other sector doesn't rise and also fuel price rise may not immediately result in other sector price rising for a short while it may be skewflation it is possible i you know in theory it is possible moving on so 20 answer is c 21 time starts
Okay, so time out. I think I have only one or two people who have given me the wrong answer. Okay, three now. Okay, four now. Uh, so except the second statement, all of the statements are correct. Um, so second statement is wrong because customer does not have to pay. What is tokenization? When we enter our card details on websites like Amazon and all those things, we are giving our card details to Amazon itself, which is bringing a risk associated with the with our financial instruments like that card debit card or credit card instead if we request a tokenization what will happen is uh, amazon or flipkart they don't maintain our detail they take this particular customer and they take it to the bank and they say please convert it into token form which is a representation the actual data is not given a representation a representation like a, an id card ID number is provided. So Amazon will only get to see or Flipkart will only get to see the ID number. They don't get to see the actual information that is associated with. So it provides protection for a customer. It refers to the replacement of actual card details with alternate code called a token. So the process is called as tokenization. It shall be unique for a combination of card token requester. Here token requester is not us. It is the uh, say Amazon or an entity like that and the device in which we are transacting. Okay. Customer pays for the service is wrong. Customer doesn't have to pay it. If there is a payment associated, the token requester, they will do it. Customer doesn't have to pay. It is provided as a benefit to the customer itself. So B1 and 3 is the correct answer. Okay. Moving to 22. Time starts. Okay, we're done with the time, right? Yeah, it's quite a lengthy statement. I'll just wait for a few more seconds. All the statements are quite lengthy. All right, so we'll start. I don't expect UPC to ask questions in this detail or depth with respect to this concept. It's a fairly new concept. The questions are likely to be more superficial. But I just asked it so that you are familiar with it in case it goes to that extent. So all your conventional questions about CBDC you would have already seen with respect to uh, the fact that it is RBA launch and a pilot program and all those things. Basic thing, it is a crypto kind of a technology which is there and all those things. This is a little deeper into the concept. So um, RBA has launched separate digital currency for retail and wholesale segment. This itself was, is not very common knowledge, right? Um, so um uh, that is correct actually so the symbol is what i have given there e that rupee sign hyphen r for retail and hyphen w for wholesale it actually launched rb launched these two as two separate pilot programs i think it launched wholesale first and then it launched retail and there is a significant difference in how it works as well the wholesale is actually entirely governed by the rb itself the entire money is in the is a liability on the see, all the throughout uh, the entire thing is a liability on the rba but the transactions are recorded by the RBA itself. So if you are dealing with a digital rupee wholesale, it is directly for, with the RBA that you are dealing. You go to the RBA, you get that converted and RBA acts like a bank in this case, which is not common. Okay. But when it comes to retail, now you would have read from a lot of places that CBDC itself means the role of bank itself will be invalid because RBA directly does it. With retail, that is not how it works. The bank is involved in this process. It is to the bank as a consumer, as a retail consumer, we go to the bank, we convert our currency to digital currency and the bank is the one which keeps the account. With wholesale, RB keeps the account. With retail, bank keeps the account. So the role of the bank continues to exist when it comes to CBDC retail. Now, this question was meant just to give information. All statements are correct. D is the correct answer. Okay. There is nothing, no trickery here just to give you that information. 
So wholesale uh, digital rupees. Now, for now, it is limited to use in settlement of secondary market transactions in G6. That is the only place where it is used. Okay. So RBA looks at it as a mechanism to introduce there. RBA is directly dealing with G, uh, that uh, digital rupee wholesale where only GSEC transactions, the entire GSEC transactions are governed by RBA itself. So it becomes easier for them. Whereas in retail, it is in the form of tokens. It represents your rupee. You give a 10 rupee note, you can convert it into um, a, a, a digital currency of the equivalent value. So it's completely the same as you could say our uh, currency without their actual, actually being a physical thing. So it's in the form of digital tokens, represent legal tender, issued in the same denominations as paper currency and coins. For most of us, we are not practically familiar with this because it's still a pilot program. But sometime in the future, it is something that we might end up using as well. Okay, just, just be aware of it. This is purely informative. D is the correct answer here. All three statements are correct. Okay, so we are going to have a series of questions now based on banking. So maybe I expect another 15 minutes or so should be done. Let's see. Seven questions, 15 might be a bit of a stretch, but let's see. Time starts. Okay, we are about to run out of time. All right, so the explanation itself conveys it. DBU will provide convenient access. A lot of people are very sure that B is the answer. Uh, let's see. So DBUs will provide convenient access and enhance digital experience in an efficient, paperless, secured, and connected environment. It's very generic in statement. The whole idea of ease of living of common citizens, digital banking units, everything about the first statement is just generic explanation of the concept. They're correct. Okay. Second statement is where the trick lies. They provide all services offered by a physical bank. So when we say that it provides a digital experience, it reduces the human involvement over there or paper trail involvement. Ask a simple question. Can they issue checkbook? They cannot issue. DBUs cannot issue a checkbook. What DBU can do? In a DBU, you can raise a request for a checkbook, but the issue of the checkbook is not done there. It will be given by the physical bank. It will be sent to your home address. Okay. Or you can go to the branch office and collect it. A lot of activities you can do for now. Some activities you cannot do. You actually have to go to a physical bank. The idea is for all those activities where you don't require a physical bank, this is an alternative that is given. Lesser investment for the bank also because manpower requirement is lesser, more easy access for common people also. So they don't provide all services offered by a physical bank, but they do provide a lot of services that are provided by a physical bank, which need not be in physical form. The second statement is wrong. Uh, now the third question, all the sch scheduled commercial banks, oh, I should have mentioned it as scheduled commercial banks. I cannot use a direct short form just like that. Okay, All the scheduled commercial banks other than RRBs, payment banks and local area banks can set up DBUs. It's correct. It's factual. It's from the RBA website. So one and three are corrected. D is the correct answer here. Second statement is wrong because they don't provide all the facilities or all the services. Moving on to 24. Time starts. We're done with the time. Now we are. <laughs> so someone said D and then said, sorry, A. Um, 
So let's look at the statements. Uh, but payment aggregator, so this is where sometimes your digital banking payment aggregation could be sometimes confusing, similar kind of. These are areas where I've got questions saying, what is the difference between these two? So digital banking units means SBA, SB itself has a digital banking unit, something which represents SB itself. You can actually go there, basic infrastructure would be there. It is doesn't, digital banking unit doesn't mean that doesn't physically exist. It doesn't have physical manpower over there, just like a chaos that you have, like an ATM or something like that, where you can go and do certain activities. It doesn't, it has very limited uh, physical presence, but it is still physically, there are entities which are set up. But payment aggregator is a different concept altogether. So payment aggregator means, so when you go to a platform, let's say you go to Flipkart and you buy a commodity. When the transaction is happening, who provides the uh, bank transactions and all those things? Who's providing that web page where you can do all the transactions? So you would have uh, seen, come across this term called as Razor Pay or Mobi Quicken. There are different terms that you may have come across. So they are what we call as payment aggregators. Okay, They provide the service of completing financial transactions on behalf of, say, Amazon or Flipkart or any of these, any other, you, any other store. Say anyone else was an online store. So not just online, it could be actual physical stores as well. You have your point of sale machines, who's providing your QR codes. They are all payment aggregators. Whoever is providing those QR cards and, and enabling those transactions, that is what is called as payment aggregators. They're entities that facilitate e-commerce sites and merchants to accept various payment instruments from customers for a complete completion of, not PF, of their payment obligations, correct? They eliminate the need for merchants to create a separate payment uh, integration system of their own. If payment aggregators don't exist, let's say I own a store, I have to put in all the infrastructure necessary for creating a payment system of my own. That is not necessary because they take care of all the infrastructure that is there. Okay. And then finally, banks as well as non-bank PAs require a separate authorization from RBA. This is where there is an error. So the third statement is wrong. Answer is A, one and two only. Non-bank Payment aggregators require a separate authorization, but banks are already a part of the payment and settlement system of RBA. They don't need a separate. They already have the license of being payment aggregators. It is only non-bank PAs which require a separate authorization from RBA as a part of payments and settlement system. Previously, only banks were allowed to do payment and settlement activities. Now, non-bank entities are also given the permission to do that. So the third statement is wrong because banks don't require a separate authorization. Only non-bank PAs require that. So answer is A, 1 and 2. Moving on. UPA pay now linkage. Time has started. Uh, Arindita, if you could mention the question that you are referring to, it would be easier for me to give you an answer. Samush, skip. Okay. Twenty-three. I'll get back to it after this question. We are on 25 now. All right. So we are, uh, this is nearly an informative question. So both the statements here are correct. He is the answer. Both the statements are correct. So this was uh, in a way a landmark event because it's happening for the first time. The second statement is correct. Singapore is the first country with which India has launched cross-border person-to-person payment facilities. Uh, fast payment system of the two countries is what is being linked. The linkage is a pro project between uh, RBA and Monetary Authority of Singapore to link the payment system, fast payment systems. India has UPI, which is fast payment system. Similarly, Singapore has a mechanism called as PayNow. The link between UPI and PayNow, where you can now transact from UPI to PayNow, there is a linkage. So we can easily send money from India, India to Singapore or Singapore to India. And India has a lot of expat population in Singapore. Okay, so that is why this becomes or this gains prominence. Transactions between the countries now become faster and much more uh, efficient. Okay, 
So uh, 25, uh, the answer is uh, both the statements, 25 C, both 1 and 2. Okay. So previously someone had asked a question about 23. So 23, the answer is uh, um, D, 1 and 3. Second statement is wrong because it doesn't provide all the services offered by a physical bank. That's the error there. Okay. 26 now. Time starts. Tamil, at a later point, I can. Maybe at the end, if you can stay back, then maybe. I am done. Okay, Financial Service Institutions Bureau. Um, as the first statement itself says, previously we had Bank Both Bureau, but the issue with Bank Both Bureau is that um, based on certain controversies and issues that came up, uh, the appointments made by Bank Both Bureau has raised a lot of questions. Sometimes some seniors have been bypassed. And without proper explanation. So question marks have been raised on the functioning of Bank Boards Bureau. So it necessitated the government to introduce a replacement body, which is the Financial Services Institutions Bo uh, Bureau. So it is a replacement of BBB. And what was BBB's main mandate? To make recommendations towards filling critical posts. Okay. So that is uh, the uh, first statement is correct in that sense. Okay. So second one. The Bureau will also be involved in formulating and developing business strategies for state-run banks and help them in their fundraising plans. It's just explanation. That's correct. It would also monitor and assess the performance of public sector banks, government-owned financial institutions and insurance companies, not just banks, because previously it was Bank Boards Bureau. Now it also includes other government-owned financial institutions and insurance companies also. So that is an addition that is there. So if the first statement you would assume to be true because insurance or other financial institutions are involved, then the third also has to be correct. So in this uh, context, all the three statements are correct, merely informative in nature. So all three statements are correct. Just do read up a little more about uh, how the members are appointed themselves. But right now, that may not be as important. Just know what is the role of FSIB. But if you can read up a little more about it, it could be useful for you. Okay, so that was 26. Answer is D. Okay, moving to the last four questions, 27 now. The time starts. I see a raised hand by DJ. If you could. Uh, send me a text. Okay, so you're done. Most people have got the answer right. Uh, almost everyone was answered. So the answer here is C. Again, merely explanatory in nature. SEBI has approved SSE. It's a stock exchange. So SEBI will have a key role to play in this. Has approved SSE for the purpose of fundraising by social enterprises. It's there in the name itself. right? Um, social enterprises eligible to participate in SSE should be entities having social intent and impact as their primary goal. See, now uh, both the statements are correct. See, both one and two are correct, explanatory in nature. The idea is this. If you are working as a company who doesn't have profit as your primary motive, so it is applicable for non-profit organizations also, even profit-oriented organizations, but profit is not the key motive. Okay, When you are a company where profit is not the key motive, 
you might find it extremely difficult to raise money from the conventional share market because anyone who goes to the conventional share market is thinking, okay, dividend or profit, I will get a share of the profit in the form of dividend. So that is the logic of investing in shares. Now, they might find it difficult to raise money from there. So the government has thought of this concept in the budget. It was announced a year or so ago, year or two ago, that a special stock exchange where the moment anyone who goes there, they know that profit is not the key motive. There are a lot of people who might be interested in investing towards socially relevant purposes, but they don't have huge amounts of money to invest. The whole idea of stock market is uh, small amounts of money can be invested there, right? So uh, from multiple sources, huge sources. So such companies to raise money from uh, people who are not only working on profit motive, who want to invest in socially small amounts, but in socially relevant activities for them, a separate social uh, stock exchange called a social stock exchange has to be used. But there are restrictions on the companies which are raising money from here because they cannot raise money from here and use it for whatever purpose that they want. Okay, they have to show to the concerned organization that they are using the money in the right way as well. There are certain guidelines that are associated with it as well. But this is the general idea of what is a social stock exchange. Both the statements are correct. Okay, there's three more questions. Sit tight. Almost there. Time starts. Technical textiles. I'll answer that uh, before I explain this one. All right. So, what are technical textiles? Let me look at the answers. Um, see, okay. All right. So, a lot of people saying C, some people saying D, but most are, most answers are C. All right. So, there is a general logic by which you can eliminate one statement, and that will help you arrive at the answer itself. The one statement is the first statement. Technical textiles account for nearly 80% of India's total textile and apparel market. If you have a general idea of what is technical textile, it is textile itself, but used for uh, your non-conventional uh, purposes or uh, textiles of a particular type. Okay? It has wide variety of use, uses. Um, so textiles made of, uh, let's say, jute or certain types of, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you can't quite call it as uh, plastic, but similar kind of compounds that are there. So that is what is the whole idea of technical textiles. Okay, so it, it has application in ma manufacturing parachutes or sports appliances, even defense appliances. Your bulletproof vests, all these can be created out of technical textiles. Okay, tents can be created out of technical textiles. So that is the whole idea. Eighty percentage of India's textile market is technical textile. You should have been hearing about text technical textile for a very long period of time. It is an evolving area. Evolving area cannot already have eighty percentage. That's a logic that you can apply. You eliminate one, you are left with only one answer. C is the correct answer. First statement is wrong. It is not eighty percentage. It currently accounts for a much much smaller uh, proportion of it. If um, um, I, I forget the exact number that is there. So I'll let you know. Meanwhile, the second and the third statements are uh, correct. So there is they are very generic in nature. Um, also, I before I forget, there are a couple of queries which came about the previous question. I'll come back. I am here to tell you what how much does it account for. Bharat is asking, does SSC come under the purview of FCRA? Uh, Unfortunately, I don't know yet. I, with respect to FCRA, I don't know first of all whether regulations have been put in place with respect to foreign contributions or not. Is there any particular reason why you ask this question? Is there a context to it? Please let me know. Then Arvind is asking, will it be effective as it has no returns? No, we can't say it has no returns. Even a company which doesn't work with profit as motive may make certain profits and sometimes philanthropic measures. For example, let's say you are an extremely rich person. 
you can go and run some charitable organization like akshaya patra or such non profit organization what if you don't have that much money but out of your salary you believe that you want to contribute something towards charitable organizations so instead of randomly giving in and the problem with respect to giving money to charitable organizations sometimes is you don't know whether they are actually using it for charity this is where the government provides an opportunity saying if you want to be sure and the government is saying that we, we are regulating it properly we will ensure that the money is used for charitable purposes or socially relevant purposes not ne- not just charity socially relevant purposes so rather than giving it to some random organization why don't you come and put the money over here small amounts of money that is where it is expected to raise money from those people who are putting their money with profit as the as not the motive over there so it can raise money in that sense okay so that is the answer to it uh, bharat please let me know if there is if there is a context to it to your question okay so i told you that uh, with respect to technical textiles i'll let you know uh, what is the contribution it contributes roughly around 10% of india's total textile and apparel market okay so that is the number not 80% uh the exact number is 13 percentage but roughly 10 percentage if you can remember it that way that would be sufficient so that is the error with the uh, first statement okay so there is uh, this website called as invest india which all of you might be familiar with or some of you might be familiar with i do sometimes use it in class if it's relevant so this is the website invest india so this website has information on uh technical textiles because of the focus that is given there so this is the website this gives you a lot of information about fdi and all investments into india and all those things investindia.gov.in but more specifically you can search just technical textiles and the best source of information that you have is from this website the future of textiles technical textiles important because the prime minister himself made a lot of comments about this and a lot of uh, key government uh, comments have been about focusing on technical textiles so it has an overview where are the various segments where it is used from a science and tech perspective itself these are the main main segments and applications where it can be used so becomes very important just read up generally about this the numbers rate of growth and all those may not be as important more from a science and tech perspective than from a uh, an economic perspective okay all right so moving on to 29th question just two more i must started okay we done so let me look at the answers so b is the dominant answer b is two only uh, okay let's take a look at it scheme for promotion of bulk drug parks under which the ministry of ayush claims uh, aims to support the setting up of first of all if you are familiar with what is bulk drug the generic drugs that are manufactured what does that have to do with the ministry of ayush ministry of ayush is about your indigenous medical systems right so it is the department of pharmaceuticals ministry of pharmaceuticals which is involved in this not the ministry of ayush that is where the first statement is wrong everything else about it is correct 3000 crore is set up three drug parks were proposed to be set up as per the budget recently the approval has been given to three states for setting up a drug parks over there 3000 crore is the outlay 1000 crore per drug park uh, bulk drug park 
scheme intends to reduce India's high dependence on imports for manufacturing bulk drugs. So during COVID, there was this problem. India is a big, huge pharma pharmaceutical. So we can pharmacy of the world. We are defined as, but we are dependent on Chinese imports for active pharmaceutical ingredients (API). We do produce a lot, but we are also dependent on. uh imports from there to reduce the import dependence and to make india truly atmanirbhar in the context of pharmaceuticals is why this particular uh, scheme was launched so the second statement is correct the first statement is wrong because it's not the ministry of ayush pharmaceuticals ministry or the department of pharmaceuticals is the one which is involved in this b2 only is the correct answer okay so meanwhile to answer a previous question bharat uh, no uh, uh, bharat's question was whether uh, firms in social stock exchange have to be registered under fcra um, it it's a good question to know because i can give you some extra information um, sse does not allow foreign investments as of now so you foreigners are not foreign portfolio investments or that kind of investment is not allowed in social stock exchange so the question of fcra doesn't even come into the picture so i hope that answers your question moving to the last question that we have Time starts. Welcome, Bharat. okay we are out of time so 29th uh, i told you the answer is uh, two only earlier someone asked me about 29th answer two only okay 30th uh 30th again uh, a very general kind of informative kind of statement the answer is d 1 2 and 3 the answer for 30 is d 1 2 and 3 let's look at the statements one by one ondc is an initiative aiming at promoting open networks for all aspects of exchange of goods and services over digital or electronic networks it will enable local commerce across segments such as mobility grocery food delivery and travel to be discovered and engaged by any network enabled application network enabled application being the important one it is an initiative of dpiit uh, it's correct it is not actually actively run by them but is an initiative of that uh, department there's no doubt about it first of all what is open network for digital commerce ondc the idea is that um, we have let's say something like again i'm taking the similar kind of examples amazon or flipkart okay let's say i have an account in amazon and there are some sellers who are registered on amazon when i want to buy a particular product i want to buy a mobile phone i can buy only from those sellers who are registered on amazon so it's only my options are limited to that there may be so many other sellers of the same mobile phone or some other object that i am buying by who are not registered on amazon who are registered on some other website let's say flipkart let's say some other local uh, other uh, e, e commerce platform if there is any that uh, that is it or there is no e commerce platform itself there is some other seller who is not registered on any e commerce platform my options are restricted to those entities who are registered on the amazon network alone similarly for a seller also they have to be registered with amazon to sell on amazon they have to be registered separately with flipkart to sell on flipkart or they have to be separately registered with some other entity to sell there so they need individual registrations everywhere otherwise there are, there might be some customer who says most of my products i am buying from flipkart i won't i don't even have an account in amazon which means a producer who's registered or a seller who's registered on amazon is missing out on a customer who's not registered on amazon so this is a problem It narrows down the buyers and sellers the contact between buyers and sellers so the government came up with an initiative where they said we are going to create something called as an open network for digital commerce where whoever is the interested seller can come and register there okay whoever is see even someone like uh, something like an amazon or flipkart can go and register themselves with uh, ondc and a seller who is interested can go and look uh, register themselves there which means that now if you access it through the open network for digital commerce 
any seller who's registered or any network enabled application network here is open network right network enabled application anyone can access any any seller can access any buyer any buyer can access any seller it need not be app specific okay which is why it is called as open network so that is the whole idea of it to you can say democratize the whole e-commerce segment is the whole idea behind uh, the concept of open network for digital commerce okay there is a very interesting 5 minute video or 7 minute video about explaining the concept of ondc which you can download from their official uh, website itself so um ondc just type ondc it will give you a, a very good overview of so their official website open network for digital commerce there is a uh, a video which is given uh, where is the video no more and must be somewhere here maybe about or maybe you click on home there is a 7 minute video i randomly popped up i think somewhere you click you will get the video i am not able to it's not still very user friendly um, about i think learn about ondc opens up that video i think I'm not sure but there is a video here i'm sure about that so this is a source from where you can access it okay so uh, that brings us to an end of the 30 questions that i have um yeah so to democratize online correct um Karthik, thank you for that that brings us uh, to an end of the questions that i have had in mind so if there is something else that you would like to ask um, you can you are free to ask uh, ask away uh, meanwhile, there is a question earlier asked about UPI 123. I'm looking for who to us who asked just to address the person. Okay. Tamil asked me, uh, can I explain UPI pay, 123 pay? So the idea is for us to use UPI now, we need a, a, a smartphone with internet connection and all those, right? How about UPI for people who do not have an internet mobile phone, who have a featured phone, like our previous 0 kind of phones? So UPI 123 pay is an option by which they have a few alternatives. They can type an IVR code or they can call and uh, make transactions by giving a certain code. That facility is called as, in general terms, that is what is called as UPA 123Pay. For feature phone users, how to use uh, UPA. Okay, so hope that answers your question, Tamil. How to cover uh, economic surveys by C? I think at this point, you shouldn't focus on economic survey too much. Just focus on certain areas, certain tables. Look at previous year UPC questions. What are the trends like I took up today, right? Trends, data, table, patterns. That is what you should focus on. For means, uh, economic survey becomes uh, even more um, important. Okay. From a means perspective, it uh, um, you can take some information with respect to schemes and all those things from there. And that is what you can, uh, that is how you can use that. Okay. Economic survey. From prelims perspective, just uh, now, if you go and start reading everything, it is a little uh, too time consuming in nature. So I don't know how to share any communication mechanism. Can you write to Shankar Academy and ask for my information? I'll My mail ID will be shared by them. You can find uh, Shankar Academy's communication because this video, I think, is shared on YouTube as well. So I don't want to give any communication mechanism with such an open platform. Uh, just write to... Um, if you have my mail ID, you can write to me. I'll respond to that. Uh, if you have been a past student or just write to Shankar Academy, they will find some communication there. I will make sure that I'll, I'll ask them to reply individually to you on mail, giving my email ID, then we'll communicate. Okay. I, I hope you understand my hesitation to share on an open platform uh, any communication mechanism. So. Anyway, so Satish Kumar, can I explain zero coupon bonds? Can we say T-bills and CMB as zero coupon bonds? Yes, we can call it as zero coupon bonds. Zero coupon bonds means uh, bonds which have zero interest rate because your uh, T-bills and uh, cash management bills do not work on the concept of interest rate. They work on the concept of issued at discount and redeemed at par. So how T-bill works is government issues a T-bill and says 91 days later, I'll give you 1000 rupees. They tell you how much they'll give you. So what is the uh, gain that you have? Government says, okay, I want minimum 900 rupees. I'll give you 1000 rupees after three months. Minimum, I want 900 rupees. Now auction starts to buy the table. Someone says, I'll give you 910. Someone says, I'll give you 920. Someone says, I'll give you 930. 
finally it is settled for 950 so the government gets 950 they'll give you 1000 so there is no interest rate the gap between 1000 and 950 is what is your gain so that is what is called as zero coupon bonds okay bond yield and inversely proportional to bond price please explain whether bond here denotes both g6 and t bills bond here denotes primarily g6 because t bills are short term but everything is a bond so uh, dated g6 is what is usually referred to in this case uh, mithilesh are you a student of shankar academy do you have any contact information of mine if so drop a text so that i can explain to you in fact i think i have explained the link between bond yield and uh, in one of the videos that's there on youtube as well okay just okay a couple of questions have come i think maybe i'll answer it now itself bond yield and bond price i'll explain the relationship welcome priyadarshini dev uh, sas welcome is there any zero coupon bond other than tables and CMB? Uh, your, I think commercial papers and uh, uh, are also zero coupon bonds, if I'm not wrong. Um, so those are government securities, but private securities can be zero coupon bonds also. Yeah, Mithilesh, actually stay back uh, because I think uh, other people, a couple of others are also asking. So I think I'll I'll explain bond yield and um, bond uh, the price relationship between bond yield and bond price now itself welcome aravind meena priya what is crowding effect so there is nothing called as crowding crowding effect it is either crowding in effect or crowding out effect if you are asking in the context of uh, government expenditure so the idea is simple if the government were to increase their expenditure government increases their expenditure generally capital expenditure government increases their capital expenditure if it results in more and more investments coming in, private investments coming in, it is called as crowding in effect. Because government is building roads and infrastructure, other investments are coming in. Okay. If the government were to increase their expenditure as a result of that increase, the private investors are either looking at the government as competition or the private investors, see, government to spend money, they have to borrow, right? When they borrow, the interest rate tends to go up. Because government is borrowing, others are also borrowing, demand for money is increasing. So government borrowing means private investors will now find borrowing costlier. As a result, they may not borrow. So if the government increases expenditure, as a result, private investors go away. That is called as crowding out effect. So there is crowding in and crowding out effect. Crowding in means government investment is resulting in more investment. Crowding out means government investment is resulting in investments reducing, private investments reducing. So I hope that clarifies it. Okay, so crowding effect I have answered. So uh, what bond price and bond yield, uh, the idea is this. Uh, this is primarily in the secondary market, okay, not in the primary market. Uh, Satish, I'll answer that, uh, but let me finish this one. So this is in the secondary market, okay. So there is, imagine that there is a bond. Uh, government issues a bond and borrows 1000 rupees. Government says they'll pay 8% in return. First year, five year bond. Okay, 8% is the return. So 80 rupees is what the person will get at the end of year. Every year, the person will get 80 rupees. Second year, let us say there is inflation. When there is inflation, interest rates in the economy also go up. Okay, so now in the second year, when the government is trying to borrow money, it is issuing a new bond. It has to offer a higher interest rate because of inflation, the interest rates have gone up. So it has to offer higher interest rate. So the government is offering 10 percentage as the interest rate on it instead of 8 percentage the government in the second year borrows 1000 rupees but is offering 10 percentage as the uh, interest okay so there are two government bonds now first bond and second bond first bond has 8 percent in return second bond has 10 percent in return first bond offers 80 rupees on 1000 rupees second bond offers 100 rupees on 1000 rupees okay now the person who bought the first bond in the second year when the person is trying to sell it no one is buying the bond why is no one buying the bond? Because there is already a bond which is offering much greater than the first bond. So why would anyone buy the first bond? So what will the first person do? The first person will be forced to sell the bond at a lesser price because the person cannot alter the interest rate. The person, what can, they can do is they can sell their bond at a lesser price. Let us say they sell it at 20 rupees lesser than usual. So they bought the bond at 1000 uh, rupees. They are now willing to sell it at 980 rupees which is a loss for them. Why are they doing it? Because they need immediate cash. Otherwise, no one would do it. They need immediate cash. 
so they are willing to sell it at even 980 rupees when it is sold at 980 rupees the 1000 rupee bond will still fetch 80 rupees so 980 rupees will fetch 1080 rupees so 980 rupees will fetch 100 rupees on top of it whereas there is another bond which fetches 100 rupees on 1000 rupees this first bond is now fetching 100 rupees on 980 rupees okay so the bond price has gone down the yield of the bond which was previously 8 percentage is now more than 8 percentage 100 rupees on 980 is more than 8 percentage when the bond price goes down the rate of yield or the yield goes up so this is the inverse relationship between bond price and bond yield okay it is better explained if i could write it but then that will take a lot of time it will it is a bigger explanation if you can uh, no uh, communicate with me just find my email id or write to shankar academy so i will get the information or you you will be shared my mail id then i can share the written explanation of this i have a written explanation with me i can do that for you all right so if you want a further explanation of bond price and bond yield if not go to rbi's website so i'll show you to understand the uh, relation between bond price and bond yield itself i'll show you a very good source just type g6 rbi faq okay so there is an faq on government securities that rbi has here you will find a discussion on yield where are you yield or is it not this one i think this is the one yeah here it is how is yield yield based auction uh, question number 4 price based auction uh, wasn't there another one wait no maybe not this one ha ah, so this is yeah what are the basic mathematical concepts one should know for calculation involving bond prices and yields it is very complicated probably so you can take a look at it but if you find it uh, difficult to understand uh, okay what is the relationship between uh, yield and price of a bond how is yield of a bond calculated so an illustration is provided okay so this should help you if you are not able to communicate with me else communicate with me find a way shankar academy through that come to me i will help you out all right uh welcome mithilesh rajeshri is asking how does repo rate affect bond yield and uh, rate uh, when the repo when there is inflation repo rate increases when the repo rate increases logically bond yield also has to increase if the government is trying to borrow money if the repo rate is high they will have to offer uh, higher rates as well so bond yield tends to go up as well at least in the primary segment bond yield tends to rise along with repo is what is the general understanding but you have to be very specific in which direction we are talking inflation adjusted bonds this scenario will be insignificant right inflation adjusted bonds yes to a large extent insignificant but inflation adjusted bonds forms a very small part of overall government borrowing so it is not significant enough for us to say that that is a big factor okay ninth question option a is it for all state owned taxes revenue is a major no for not for every individual state not for every individual state so we have uh, i had downloaded that page right so not for so take a look at this not for every single state that is there but for all states put together all the states put together the money that they receive here it is so this is for all states and uts with their own legislature not for every single state satish hope that answers the question cumulatively for all states is what you know i hope there is uh, no unanswered question um so i think uh, we'll wind up the session with this hope you had a informative session 16th question due to internationalization of rupee will rupee appreciate and exports decrease so exchange rate will be affected see for rupee to uh, appreciate exports decrease uh shrinath did uh, are you a student of sia do you happen to have my mail id
Bangalore TCM batch. You have my mail ID then, right? Just uh, contact the Bangalore uh, office and they'll give you my email ID or my Telegram ID. Uh, tell them that you, uh, I told you to share the Telegram ID, not the number. Please don't ask for number. Telegram ID. Or just my mail ID. You ask them for my mail ID, I'll, uh, we, we can interact. Okay, so 16th question, due to internationalization, will rupee appreciate and exports decrease, so exchange rate will be affected. Uh, did I say that exchange rate will be unaffected? Why do you ask this question? 16th question. It is a process that involves, okay, it is a process. Uh, it increases the exchange rate risk. Uh, is the part that I think you might have a question with. Mm. Due to internationalization of rupee, will rupee appreciate? Uh, no, why would uh, rupee appreciate? Because greater demand for rupee, okay. But appreciate with respect to which currency? Appreciation is a concept with respect to two currencies, right? With which currency are you talking about? You are still talking about the internationalization of rupee and talking about transacting in dollars. Your transaction itself is in rupee, right? So where is this uh, concept coming? Which appreciation with respect to what currency? That is a question that is raised now, right? So rupee in the global scenario gets appreciated, no doubt about it. Also, um, exports may re reduce, exchange rate may be affected, exchange rate will stabilize, it may have some benefits, there may be some uh, disadvantages, for example, developed countries, they find it hard to export, USA has a trade deficit with a lot of countries, all that is true. So in the long run, maybe it is possible that uh, it can have some impact. To say that it increases the exchange rate risk on domestic traders is highly, uh, you know, it's very drastic to claim that. Okay, so hope uh, that gives you some clarity on that. All right, so I think we have gone way overboard. We started a little late, but still considering that also we have gone at least half an hour overboard. So we'll wind up the session with this. Thank you so much.